greetings and welcome to the 2024 EdMap Summit. My name is Christy Trifone Milhouse, and I'm your NASE, my executive director. Before we get started, uh, a few housekeeping items to share. Please find the chat button, share with us where you're joining us from. We always like to see the geographic range of our participants. Also, if you have questions during the, the presentation, please use the Q&A and not the chat. You put it in the chat, we won't be able to answer it. Uh, finally, after each presentation, let the presenter know that you are enjoying their presentation and use the reaction button. Uh, you'll find that down at the bottom of your screen. Okay, again, welcome to the 2024 uh, EdMap Summit. We'd like to thank our co-hosts, the University of Georgia Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health for helping to put together this summit. Today's event will walk you through the EdMaps mapping system. So this tool is used for documenting invasive species and pest distribution. And we'll learn all about the system, how it works. And again, if you have questions, pop them in the Q&A. I'd like to uh, take this time to thank our sponsors. Uh, events like this are a big lift and sponsorship is critical to make every aspect of this, this event happen. Our sponsors for this year's event include the Montana Department of Ag, the Invasive Species Center in Canada, Utah Department of Agriculture and Food, Utah Weed Supervisors Association, the Colorado Department of Ag, and of course our host for the event, uh, University of Georgia Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. Before we jump into our webinar, I'd like to share with you a bit about NISMA. Uh, for those folks who don't know us or uh, may have just joined us, uh, the North American Invasive Species Management Association is deeply vested in our mission to empower the management of invasive species in North America. We are led by an eclectic 18-member board of leading experts and professionals who support committees, a strong NASMA team, and a membership that continues to grow in numbers by the day. Our most recent event, our Nisaw event, saw over 2.9 million people participate. So our network continues to grow and you're part of a strong and vibrant community. Our core programming is designed to provide our community with the connections needed to learn about advancements in the field and to share lessons learned. We also provide the collective voice through events like NISA, the National Invasive Species Awareness Week. Lastly, we aim to provide the tools, including education and professional development opportunities, international standards, international campaigns, and the NASMA Certified Weed-Free Products Program to broaden our impact and to further our mission. One of the events you will not want to miss in 2024 is our NASMA annual conference. So mark your calendars, plan to join us. Over 300 will be in attendance at our Missoula event from September 30th through October 3rd. And our theme for this year is sharing stories and celebrating partnerships. There will be over 70 sessions to attend and two additional events, including a symposium on invasive annual grasses, hosted by our partners at the University of Wyoming's Institute for Managing Annual Grasses Invading Natural Ecosystems and the Invasive Annual Grasses Technical Transfer Partnership. The second event will be a continental dialogue on non-native forest insects and diseases hosted by the Nature Conservancy. This is an event you won't want to miss. Registration is open. Please hit up the uh, NASMA website today and get signed up. As a friendly reminder, your membership does help us to fund our programming. If you're not currently a member, we offer a variety of different membership options. And in an attempt to make it easier for folks to join, we've added a monthly payment plan for our professional membership level. In addition to individual membership options, we do have organizational memberships to offer as well. I encourage you uh, to join our community if you're not currently a member. Okay, now time for the main event. For those of you who may not be able to attend the entire summit today, 
The recording will be posted to NASMA's YouTube channel later next week. Here's a quick look at the agenda we've got planned for you today. We'll have opportunities again for you to ask questions after each presentation. And again, a friendly reminder, use that Q&A box and not the chat. Uh, take a look first to see if anybody else has asked questions that are very similar to yours uh, and give a thumbs up to promote that question to the top of the list. And again, reactions are great. Our presenters love to hear how you feel about their presentation. Uh, lots of thumbs up, lots of hearts. Uh, please let them know how they're doing. Okay, now time to introduce our first speaker, Chuck Bargeron. Chuck is the director of the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health at the University of Georgia. He's been with UGA for 25 years, during which time his work has focused on invasive species and information technology. He is the former chair of the National Invasive Species Advisory Council and former president of NASMA. Chuck has been an invited speaker at over 350 regional and national conferences and co-authored over 67 journal articles and outreach publications. I want to thank Chuck for joining us today and go ahead and share your presentation and we will get started. Perfect. Thank you, Christy. Let's dive into this. Um, all right. Good morning. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm going to get things kicked off with kind of an overview. Um, we've done this each of the past four years that we've done these virtual summits, and, and I thank y'all all for joining us today. We've got a, a great group that are going to talk about some of the changes and new things that we've done with EdMaps over the last year and, and some of the future directions that we're going. So, you know, tune in as much as you can today. And um, again, thanks for joining us for this fourth um, annual EdMaps Summit. All right, so as was mentioned, EdMaps is run out of the University of Georgia Center for Invasive Species or Ec or Ec and Ecosystem Health. Our web address is bugwood.org, and I would encourage everyone to go there and check out all the different programs offered by the center. So for those of y'all that are new, what is EdMaps? Well, EdMaps, the name came from Early Detection and Distribution Map mapping system. And, and that's really what we see EdMaps is, as two different things. It's that reporting system to make it very easy to report an invasive species, and then having the ability for that data to come out in a lot of different formats. And so you take that and you add it to the existing library of identification and management information that exists as part of the center, and you have this great resource that can help solve problems. We wanted to make EdMaps as easy as possible. You know, this is all about helping facilitate local early detection and rapid response and local action and being able to provide both of you at, at the landscape level and also at the local level. And then as you're going to see through some of these presentations today, being able to document change over time and better tell our, our story of what we're doing related to invasive species. And then, and I'm gonna talk about this toward the end of this presentation, to be a platform to support additional applications. And, and as we were talking about this and how we work and how EdMaps works and what our philosophy is, it really came down to something very simple. We try to work with our partners and figure out how they do their work. And when we figure out how they do their work, then how can we make these tools fit their needs? And so that's really our philosophy. It's not about you having to change the way you work and be able to use EdMaps. It's about us making sure that EdMaps fits in your workflow the way it should. And so the first question we always get asked about EdMaps is what kind of information is required? And we put this together a few years ago, and I really think it sums up what the core information is required when you're documenting an invasive species. 
you know, what was it? Where was it? When did you see it? Who are you? How much was there? You know, how did you document it? And why did you document it? And if you think about those simple things, that is really what all invasive species data kind of ties back to. And then having the framework of when a new report comes in, who does it go to? How are the right people notified? Who has jurisdiction over it? Is it something that's new to that county, to that state, to the US, to North America? You know, and then being able to look at what was submitted, see if it was identified correctly by the person submitting it, and then determine what the next steps of how it should be handled. And then once the data is in the EdMaps database, how can we make it as accessible, as easy to use, is you know, interoperable with other systems and being able to find it through the website and different um, applications. We've also really tried to focus the tools that we've developed on different user bases. And so we're gonna see that a little bit today and the differences between the EdMaps app and the EdMaps Pro app, as well as some of the resources that are on the website. So next year, we'll have a big party as, as EdMaps turns 20 years old. The website was first launched in 2005. Um, it was 2011 when the first reporting app, I've Got One, came out. Um, that followed the next year with, with EdMaps Missouri River Watershed Coalition, which later became EdMaps West, and then all the regional apps followed from there. In 2018, we launched EdMaps Pro, Last year, we retired most of those regional apps to kind of consolidate around the EdMaps app. And then this year, as you'll see through my presentation and others, we're really trying to focus on better identifying and marketing the different tools that are available through EdMaps, improving some of our training resources, and also the resources that are available to our partners. And as a quick comparison, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more about iNaturalist later, but just looking at some of the different systems, many of which we work very closely with, but they all have very varying different tools and resources available, and they cover different things. And, and I'm gonna really get into this more when we talk about iNaturalist in a few minutes. So EdMaps is, you know, is a system, part of that system is the website and some of the tools available there, as well as the EdMaps app, which is the app that, in, that is really focused on trained professionals. So trained volunteers and, and, and professionals. So it's the app that makes it very easy to report species one at a time. It has good resources and pictures and information about those species and allows you to do that offline and then upload it later. And this is really the core app that we send most people to that know a little bit about the problem and wanna help. And then you move up to EdMaps Pro, which you're gonna hear more about today, and where you really have the power of collecting hundreds of reports in a day, of being able to go back and do revisits and update the record and better tell the story of what's going on in the area. And so you take all that and you take almost 20 years and, and this is what the, the map looks like across US and Canada. And, and obviously some of the bigger counties are gonna have more data in them, but pretty good coverage across the US and Canada in terms of data per county. And we have over 8 million records in EdMaps now, about 6 million of those have actual latitude and longitude associated with them. That's from about 47,000 different reporters and data sources. A lot of plant species are included in that data set, but also, you know, about 700 wildlife, about 700 insect species also represented in that. And amazingly, just looking at the time aspect this incorporated with a lot of the records. We've logged and documented over 21,000 hours of collecting um, invasive species occurrences um, since this launched. I, I really like this graph because it really helps 
in my mind, show the growth over time in terms of each year, how many people have been active in the system. And that is both reporting, verifying, downloading data, you know, logging in to, to view some of the advanced features. And it's great to see that increase um, over time. So a quick look at, at some of the numbers for this past year. Um, we had a, right over 200,000 new records come in. Uh, we averaged about 550 a day um, coming in from all the different various sources, about 5,500 reporters, and that was about a 15% increase from the previous year. A little bit down on revisits, but, uh, but I think that's just, you know, as people are actually that are using revisits or having successes and, and moving on and not needing to document that as much. Here's the data um, by county in, in 2023. I love to see this uptick down here in Arizona where they've really started using EdMaps and, and that was a previously a pretty big hole in the map. And so working on New Mexico and hopefully next year we'll have some better data in there as well. So the kind of data coming in, um, about half and half positive and negative data, um, which is really good um, because that negative data can be very useful. Um, also, about 13% of the data coming in is treated and then a little bit less is eradicated. Still getting a lot of data coming in from the web, about 60% of the data coming from the web, and then about 20% coming from one of the different applications, smartphone applications. Again, about 70% of the data Overall in the system is plants and, and then insects and wildlife and diseases from there. We had a big data set come in from some wildlife refuges in, in Idaho. And so we had a big uptick of Idaho data this year. But it's interesting as I go through and, and as you see with some of the sponsors for today and, and some of the states and provinces that are really embracing EdMaps, using it as their database of record in their state. Those tend to be the states and, and that have active outreach campaigns. Those tend to be the states where we get the most reports annually. And then overall, looking at that, very similar, you know, there's some IPM projects in New Jersey that helps bump that data up. And then as we're sharing data with Cal, Cal Flora, then there's also a lot of data there that's coming in. Of all the records and EdMaps, uh, I'm happy to say that 98% of them have been verified. That means somebody's reviewed them and moved those to the next level in the system. Um, we've still got a group of data from Michigan that we're working to try to find partners to help get that data verified. And then some of these other areas, some of it's just a backlog where people haven't caught up. The verification system is impressive. We have 980 verifiers throughout the U.S. and Canada that have signed up different levels of expertise to be the people that review um, this information. And that is controlled at the state level. And so it's not just anybody reviewing the data. It's somebody who has that expertise in the area. And you can look that up and see who the verifiers are by just choosing a species and dropping a point on the map. And it will show you who gets notified and who the verifiers are for that area and that species. Not only do we have this network available, what is great is we're seeing traffic to the website. And this goes through about uh, a period up to September, but we've had almost 9 million page views and that's from almost 2 million different users. So by the data going in here, we're reaching a much larger audience than just who is downloading and reporting. We also, as we were putting this together, over the last few weeks, realized that we've had a nice up in mobile use from 2022 to 2023. And so as we continue to improve the website, that's something we're going to look at even more is how we can better improve the website on mobile so you can do everything you need to do through the mobile website. I mentioned iNaturalist. iNaturalist, as everybody probably knows, has um, hundreds of millions of records now in their system. Um, we have worked with them to come up with a way to pull that data on invasive species and, and, and important pests into, into EdMaps. And so we have built what we call a triage system where the verifiers can go in and choose what data for their area 
to pull in and then they get email updates on what has come in when we run the um, pool from our naturalist every few weeks. And so with that, we've moved about 500, almost 600,000 records from our naturalist into EdMaps. We've also had about 360,000 that have been ignored for whatever reason, their species have not really concerned in those areas. You know, what I really find interesting is overall looking at that data, only about 3,000 of the 5,000 species we track in EdMaps are covered by our naturalist data. So there's a lot of species of interest to, to y'all as our user group that are not um, part of our naturalist at all. And so it's not a good source of additional data from there. And because iNaturalist was built for documenting biodiversity, not documenting invasive species, then there's some pieces in iNaturalist that can cause issues with the data, whether it's something being research grade and not being a wild population, which we've seen some cases of, or where the um, privacy is listed as obscured. And so you're not getting the exact location of the species. And if you're talking about a plant species that you want to go treat, then that becomes very difficult for you as the user or as a reviewer. And just an example of filling in the blanks and, and how EdMaps has done that over time. This is what we knew about the distribution of kudzu in 2005 when EdMaps was launched. And so... Spotty distribution across the southeast, pretty limited in, in the northeast. And this is what we know about the distribution of kudzu now. And so it's just taking the time to make the documentation so we can better say, hey, this is the vine that ate the south. And, and then when you are saying that about a species that has very spotty distribution, that is not what we as a community know but it just was not able to be documented prior to having tools like EdMaps available. All right, so some recent updates to EdMaps. Um, we have completely reworked the tools page. If you go there, it's no longer that boring list of a whole bunch of tools, but now it's really focused on the different features, the different tools within EdMaps. And maybe that's the advanced query tool that we've talked about for years, and now we've rebranded that EdMaps query just to have a simple name to go along with that and, and really help have that thing you remember. Okay, I'm going to go to EdMaps query and I'm going to pull the information I need. Um, and then we're working on building um, EdMaps Studio, which will allow you to create interactive maps based on your needs. And now we've just got some example maps up there. And, and Rebecca, in her presentation, is going to go through this more in more detail. We've also made some, some minor updates throughout the, the site. We've changed the alert icons just to, to better represent what they are, cleaned up some of the other pages. The advanced query tool that this has been out for a couple of months now, completely redesigned, trying to make it more interactive. And so you don't end up putting in parameters and then coming back with no data. So it, the, the map updates in real time as you're changing the parameters, as you're putting in what you're looking for. Something that's been asked for and needed for a while is a standalone page for the EdMaps app. So we can have something you can put a QR code on and send people to this page, and then they can have the links to both the EdMaps app and EdMaps Pro, you know, in the Apple Store or in the Google Store. So a standalone EdMaps app page, something we've been needing for a while, and now that's available. We've recently, working with our partners in USGS, added a link to the Inhabit models and so when you're looking at a species like Canada thistle, you can click on the inhabit button and it's going to open in a new window and take you directly to the modeling results in the inhabit database. And this all comes as part of what we're calling EdMaps Predictor and having the different modeling tools that are available through EdMaps and being able to click on that and see the species that have been modeled by that and then go directly to those maps. So if you're looking for what species have been modeled, you had to go to each individual species before. Now you can go directly to the predictor page, 
see the different models and then go there. We're working on a pretty major update to AdMaps Pro. Um, because of when it was developed, it was developed before Apple changed and updated um, their programming language. And so in order to make EdMaps Pro more efficient, easier to up update in the future, and take advantage of some of the newer libraries that Apple has to offer, um, EdMaps Pro is being rewritten in the Swift programming language, and that's going to go into beta testing soon. It's going to work just like you're going to hear about this afternoon but it's just in the back end, it's going to have been updated. And then we're going to add some new features to it as well once it's there. The EdMaps app and the Wild Spotter app were written in the new language, and this one just predated that. And so it hasn't been completely updated yet. Last year, I think we, we launched the concept of projects within EdMaps, um, and we've had about 50 of those set up since we launched that with different users and, and records in those different projects. You're going to hear more about dashboards this afternoon. I threw this in here because it's just exciting to see what our partners have been able to do to pull data into um, another system and really tell a story in a full dashboard about it. We continue doing education and outreach. You know, our group is cooperative extension. Our group is outreach focused. And so we do a lot of training like the summit today and in other resources to make these tools as easy for you to use as possible. Going back to 2022, and we were doing monthly office hours and we took a topic and then from 11 until 12 ish on, on the third Friday, we jumped into that and had more information about it. And we had good attendance for that as well as good post YouTube viewing, we decided to change that format a little bit. And so we've started doing bi-weekly um, Bugwood office hours to cover more of our projects than just EdMaps and really be user focused. And so the hope is for you to be able to submit questions beforehand that we can answer in that time frame, or that you just jump on and we're able to work with you almost one-on-one -on -one to to really solve any issues that you're having. And so those are from one to three Eastern on Fridays. And, and there's the website if you want to sign up and get registered for those as well as submit any questions. Um, we've got a whole presentation about this later, but really trying to help our partners with how to use the EdMaps brand, how the proper usage of logos and then making the colors and logos relatively um, easily accessible. Some things coming soon, um, the training materials page, which again is a lot of information on one page, that is moving into a knowledge base where you will be able to search for what you're looking for and be able to go in and pull those resources. Everything that's currently there will exist in this knowledge base, but it will be searchable and you'll be able to submit a ticket if you have an issue with something that we can follow up on. Another thing that's coming very soon is Connect that is Bugwood single sign-on service. So you're gonna have one place, whether you're downloading images from one of our image databases, or if you were logging on to EdMaps where you can see all that information, all your login information, all your profile information, all of your the things you've submitted to our different projects, manage your alerts, manage your emails that have been sent to you all from one interface. And once you sign into one, it's going to keep you signed in to each of the different systems. We're also going to be work, reworking our species um, information pages to make those a little more accessible and to really highlight some of the pictures and the other resources that are available as part of that. Now, what we always get, and I'm gonna give you some examples before I wrap up this presentation is, you know, you're gonna get excited hopefully about everything you're going to see today and you're gonna go, okay, I want a dashboard tomorrow. And what you have to remember is there's, there's steps to get from here to there. And you can't go from an empty spreadsheet with no data for your state, for your county, for your area, 
to a dashboard overnight. And so everybody wants the cool dashboard. Everybody wants to be able to see everything going on in the area they manage all at once. And that is all very possible. But you have to start by collecting the data, verifying the data, getting it in the database, and then you can build these cool tools on top of it. And remember that whatever bad data goes in is going to cause bad data to go out. And so making sure that things are correct, making sure you spot check data from you or your crews that's going in, just to make sure that, that you are getting good, consistent data. And, and then the next part is, well, okay, I'm starting to submit that data. What's the process look like? So the data comes in from all these different areas. It goes to the verifiers based on whether it's a regulatory or a non-regulatory species. The verifier can follow up. They can reject it. They can approve it. And then once it is approved, then it goes in, becomes publicly available if it can be. That's what populates the maps. That's what populates the dashboards, that's what populates the data feeds, that's what's shared with partners, that's what you can query through the EdMaps query, that's what makes all this work. So there's a process, you know, based on the, the species and who it goes to, and then once it goes through that process, then it becomes available and usable in the different ways. So I wanted to give a few quick case studies I think this is mostly an invasive species crowd. You're like, why are we talking about corn? I just want to give you an example with this. Corn group came to us about some of their pests. We looked at their process in terms of when they did things. They needed a collection tool. They needed a data warehouse. They needed policies on sharing the data. And so we worked with them across each of the steps from planning to set up to evaluation, to things that need to go to the lab, to things that need treatment, as well as to harvest information. And so with that, some tools have come out. Um, one was looking at what's coming my way throughout the season. So as you can see, this was at a county level, just when Southern Corn Rush showed up and then allowed to for you to kind of monitor that over time so you would know when it would come and get it close to you. Another example where Arkansas and New Jersey were both working with the same pest, but had different needs in terms of what their treatments would be based on um, different thresholds. We've also seen a species like corn earworm, where it had 7,000 records, kind of spotty coming in in 2023. Since 2024, about 98,000 records. But if you go back even farther, predating when this data was in EdMaps, there was about 300,000 records and a much larger footprint. But, you know, if you see this, these colors are years since the last data came in. And you can see there's a lot of that light blue color on the map. And so if you see that, then it goes, OK, how do we keep users engaged? How do we keep them coming back? And we figured out, well, part of it is to make it very easy for some of these very busy people to report things. And so maybe that's something like this expert map where they can just go in and color the counties that it's been found in, you know, having the very easy to use um, web-based maps, being able to do site-based reporting with traps into a form or doing that on smartphone. And then, as the manager of the project, staying on top of that incoming data and making sure that it flows as it needs to and that you keep track of what's going on. And then having some value added tools, some forecasting, some other tools that make it more useful to the, both the people submitting the data and to the project as a whole. And then continue to engage with your stakeholders you know, as often as you possibly can. Let's review what worked, what didn't work last year, and how we can move things better as we move forward. And then make it fun. And this is something we're working on right now is incorporating badges into EdMaps across the apps and across um, your profile pages. And so you'll get different badges based on different achievements. And we've seen that work. 
We ran a campaign with Juro Watch, the large Juro spiders that have showed up in Georgia. And over a two year process, by just having an online contest, we were able, you know, what really impresses me is over a thousand unique reporters and over and, and a good majority of them have only reported Juro spiders. So these are new people that we brought in and introduced to this mapping and invasive species world just because of this showy spider that showed up. And then, you know, last year, very good results. Again, more people reported during the spotting contest. And again, we had 600 reporters, mostly who had only recorded Juro spiders. And the only carrot, the only thing we were offering was digital badges. And then for the winners, we mailed them physical stickers out. So very low overhead in order to make it where it was something that worked. Some other projects, last year we heard about Squirrel on Pigs and that campaign. And then this year, we've now launched the website as well as the app to go along with that. Very focused, all the data is going into EdMaps, but really focusing on a niche within the invasive species world. And then finally, something I'm really excited about, the Wild Spotter Citizen Science Program. Wild Spotter is not just an app, it's, it's, it's a detection campaign that we can use to help protect and manage our public lands. You know, we can't get people to report invasive species that they don't understand and care about the problem. And that's where Wild Spotter, which we sometimes, you know, will refer to as EdMaps Light, is there to fill that lower niche in terms of the EdMaps, getting it out there. We held our first ambassador training course in December, and it was great. We had a great group of speakers and a great group of attendees. And at the end, we were able to graduate 59 new wild spotter ambassadors who can go forth and help spread the word. And they were trained in how to do the social part of invasive species and, and natural resource management. So um, we're going to continue this and, and do it again in February of 2025 in Alabama. And we're going to have more information soon on the invasivesfree.org um, website. So to wrap up, we've got a great agenda. Rebecca is going to do a couple of presentations, both on the different ways to report and then how to use EdMaps on the desktop. And Tristan is going to show you a walkthrough of the EdMaps app. Um, Jerry and Kevin are going to do the same thing with EdMaps Pro, and then Debbie and Melissa are going to really dive into the EdMaps brand and show how partners can better use that. And then Aaron's going to wrap us up with um, showing us the dashboards and some of the cool things that Utah have done by, by having this good data over time. I want to thank the folks that the different organizations who over time have funded different parts of EdMaps and made everything we're doing here possible. Um, almost at 20 years, um, we've shown it to be effective for all taxa. And, and I really think there's some new cool things that, that, that you're gonna find out more about today that you will really get you excited and make the tool even more useful. So thank y'all very much. Um, we'll, I'll answer some of the questions in the chat so we can keep this moving um, and um, look forward to a great day. And thank you all again for being here. Thank you so much, Chuck. That was a fantastic overview. And I'm really excited to hear all the additional presentations today. Um, I am Tegan Wilmot. I'm the Education and Prevention Manager with NASMA, and I'll be helping to moderate today's sessions. Right now, I'd like to welcome Rebecca Wallace. You can pull up your slides and begin your presentation. Thank you. Well, I'll be doing a live walkthrough of certain parts of our website. And I did mark some of the questions in the question and answer box that I'll answer them live. So this is starting with the EdMaps website. So I'm gonna be talking about the different tools we have for reporting. Some of them are better for certain people. Some of them are better for others. One of the things that Chuck mentioned was we're going to be in the next probably month or so having a whole new training page available. Some of those materials that'll be available will be things like this, EdMaps app versus the EdMaps Pro app, which app should I use to record invasive species? 
So this is all about figuring out the best tool for you to use in the field. Now, as Chuck mentioned, we've got some other apps like the I've Got One app, we've got Wild Spotter, but um, I'm just going to talk about some of the differences between, you know, the Edmaps app and the Edmaps Pro app. And then Jerry and Kevin and Tristan will talk later about more in-depth walkthroughs of these apps. So, you know, the Edmaps app, it has a field guide. It's much more geared towards trained volunteer, citizen scientists, casual observers, things like that. Whereas the Edmaps Pro app is much more geared towards professionals, land managers, things like that. And it does not have a field guide in the app. Um, you know, it, it's just um, figuring out, um, you know, how much effort do you have to put into your reporting based on the needs you, your program, maybe your state reporting requires. Or if you are, you know, just taking a walk outside and you happen to see something. If you're taking a walk outside and you happen to see something, the Edmaps app is uh, a much better tool for you to use. It's much easier to just download it and intuitively figure out how to use it. But it also has fewer features compared to the Edmaps Pro app. We worked with uh, Kevin and Jerry and Aaron and uh, our partners in Minnesota, our partners in other states and programs to really figure out the different features that these groups need for the Edmaps Pro app. But there's a lot of similarities between them. Both of them you can report as a point or a polygon. You can report negative records. You can uh, do a, some of the same things, but also some, there are some differences. So that's those two apps just broadly. Now, anybody can report on the website. So as Chuck mentioned, we've revamped some of our website. That includes this top bar up here. You'll notice that this top bar has changed if you're familiar with our website and you know you pay attention to the top bar. But report sightings has pretty much been one of the most important parts of the EdMaps website since EdMaps started. So if we go to report sightings, the first thing it asks is what type of thing are you reporting? Are you reporting a plant? Are you reporting an insect or something that the general public would just go, ah, an insect? So insects also includes spiders like the drawer spider, includes mites, ticks, things like that. Then you have your uh, fungi and diseases, so fungi, bacteria, viruses, things like that. And then also at the end, we've got wildlife, and we do have quite a lot of, of wildlife reporting in certain areas. Um, I'm going to click on plants because we probably have a, a majority plant audience here. And then I'll click on Georgia because I am in Georgia and that makes sense for me. So at the top, we have a notification here, red fields are required. I did see a comment about um, colorblind access. We do have colorblind uh, being a, as a consideration for a lot of things. We do talk about colorblind maps when we talk about custom maps and things like that. Um, but I was not specifically involved in choosing the various colors, so I don't know if this is like a colorblind safe red, but right now it's at least a different color th than the black. So that should be at least more easily discerned right there. So red fields are required. So as you'll notice going down this page, as I go down it, not a lot of fields are in red. So it's asking your species. Now we do have higher taxonomic reporting available. You can report at some genus level. We do have some other data that's even higher than that in working with Florida. We have some, you know, it was a monkey. Somebody saw a monkey. Not sure what kind of monkey it was, but, you know, we have no native monkeys in the U.S., so it belongs here. You just start typing it in, it'll start auto-completing what it thinks you're looking for. Infestation. So someone asked, what's the difference between positive and negative? Uh, when you're reporting an original report, so the first time you think this population has been reported, you have three options. Positive, I saw it. Negative, I looked for it, did not find it. And treated, I looked for it, found it, and performed some sort of management activity. So if you're talking about a plant, you could say, well, you know, it was pulled, it was mowed, it was treated with some sort of herbicide, so on and so forth. All of, pretty much most of the fields or options within fields have these little question marks next to those. Those are tool tips. 
So if you hover your mouse over them, or if you're on some sort of touch screen, if you touch the question mark, a little piece of information will show up to help you figure out what's going on with that field with that option of fields. Observation date, that's another required field. Defaults to the current date, but you can change that. And then the rest of this infestation section, this all changes depending on what type of species you said you're reporting. So I picked plant, so I'm seeing infested area, survey area, habitat, density, abundance, plant description, and then damage. So that was another question we had about recording new populations that are damaged because maybe there's a, a something eating it or affecting it in some way that makes it so this there might be a, a new biocontrol or it might be being affected by a biocontrol. So on the website, we do have damage as an option, so that can be recorded. But if I were reporting an insect or a disease, these would all change to different options based on the fields that the partners we've worked with have said are important. If we scroll down, as you see, I picked Georgia. It fills in Georgia. I could then pick my county. So there's a lot of counties in Georgia. I don't know if everyone knows, but we have the second most number of counties in the US. So I picked Tift County because that's where I am. My next options are, I could either manually put in the latitude and longitude, and these are decimal degrees. Every now and then we come across someone who's having trouble. It's because they're not putting in decimal degrees. That's something that you can look up if you're not familiar with the different types of coordinate systems. Or, and this is probably an easier option, if you interact with the map, and there's some information up here about how to use the map, but you pick one of these options at the top of the map. If I want to drop a point, it'll put the coordinates there. Or if I want to draw a line, it'll put the centroid of that there and you double click to end the line. Or I can clear the map and I can draw a polygon. And if I draw a polygon or if I pick a line, it actually fills in this infested area up here. So that's a fun thing there. Something new we added, I think in the last month or so, maybe a couple months, is this upload KML option. So if you have a file with one shape in it representing this individual population, you can select choose file and you can pick your KML and it'll put it on there. So that was a new thing that we added in the last couple of months. And um, it puts in the, again, the latitude and longitude uh, centroid area. And it would fill in TIFT if that was a different county it had picked. Further down, so if you want to put description of the location, you can put that. I always try to really mention this with every presentation I give. Private talks about the public being aware of the coordinates for this population. So it's automatically set to no, but you can switch that to yes. So if I switch this to yes, that means when a verifier reviews this record, they say, ah, yes, this is a fantastic record. This is a wonderful record. I'm going to make it publicly available. Everyone should know about this observation. If I clicked yes, that means that it will only show up at a county level map. It will only show up in county downloads. So no one will ever know the coordinates of this, except for, for me, the verifier who reviews the record because they need to know if I'm reporting a aquatic species in the middle of a parking lot, or if this record is part of a project, the project admins, you are allowing them to know things like the coordinates. So that's what private does. It's, it allows for reporting on private property, but not letting the public know this is exactly where something is. You can, on the website, upload up to five images and provide additional information and comments, who identified it, if you had help with that, and if a voucher was made, if, it was, if it's in a herbarium somewhere, you can note that as well. And then you would submit your record, and what Chuck ha talked about in his presentation about it being reviewed by verifiers and that whole process, that's what happens next. So this is reporting an individual occurrence through this.
form. We do have other ways data comes in, as Chuck mentioned. So one other way that data comes in is through the apps. So let me just go ahead and cover those before, before I forget. Now, they're going to be covered in much, much more detail in a little bit. But on the app, there's a lot less information available for you to, to add to a record. But all of that very important information, all that required information is still there, as well as a few of the additional options. You can still add comments, you can add images, you can add some of that infestation information. And again, in the apps, you can say if it's a positive, a treated, a negative, and so forth. So then if I go back here, so that's reporting like one record at a time through the website, through the apps. So if, if I wanted to say, upload a file, as a lot of the people to submit files of data you've been collecting either through another piece of software, or you have old data that you just didn't know there was someone out there who cared and I care. There are now two ways to get to the place to submit bulk data. So you can click on either from the home page where we have a, a bunch of those tools listed or through the tools page itself. You can click data, data upload. And this will take you to um, the place where you can uh, contribute data. So if you click upload data, it'll ask you for a batch name that's mainly for you to be able to keep track of things. It'll ask you for a reporter name, and then it'll provide you a place to upload files. Um, it's highly advised that the files be shape files, geodatabases, or Excel type files. KML files, I have a lot of trouble with just because a lot of times they're not files originally created as a KML file. They're usually converted from something else to KML. And a lot happens in between there with regards to formatting. One of the things that is now available to me and maybe in the future will be available to some of our state partners is the data import tool. So what I can do with some of the files that are sent to me is I can take those files, usually after some amount of data checking and potentially manipulation of converting formats and things like that. I can put this file that is sent to me and again, potentially reformatted certain things and put it in here. This will allow a whole bunch of checks I usually do on my own to be performed automatically. It'll tell me the things that still need to be fixed or some issues that may still exist. And then once those are fixed, I can put it into our database this way. And so this is something that has made some of the uploading of files go faster than if I did it the way I was previously doing this. So this is something we've talked about like at some of our other meetings. And so this is an important advancement that was made first for me. And then as I kind of figure out all the different things that I'm you know, keeping track of for it says this, it means that needs to be fixed. Once those error messages are all figured out, then this tool could be made available to some of our state partners if they have people that they can assign for the state to be uploading files this way. So another thing Chuck mentioned, the API tool, I just wanted to show what that looks like real quick the iNaturalist data coming in via the API. So we do get data coming in via API. Mainly right now it's iNaturalist records. We have talked about some other types of data coming in that way. So the data coming in via I, I from iNaturalist, this is kind of what it looks like. And you can, I make quote unquote verifier for everything. So I see everything, but this also shows you some of the records that are coming in and what that kind of looks like to a verifier. Again, the verifiers are the ones who decide that this research grade iNaturalist records that come in, should they actually make, make their way into EdMaps or should they not? And, and if they should go into EdMaps, do they need to be reviewed individually? Like with calorie pair, there's a lot that's planted 
do we need planted records or do we just need examples of escaping feral, you know, calorie pear trees? So they get to make those decisions on how they want the data coming from iNaturalist to be handled. We do have some ag pest monitor data coming in by API. So ag pest monitor is another system that's kind of where that corn project Chuck was talking about exists. And so just to show you, they are also in a lot of cases using the web for contributing data. Their forms can look very different because of the way that they collect data and eventually how they want that data to be displayed. So in this case, this is essentially trap data. They have a site they're going to be visiting and they're gonna have so many traps at that site and they're going to fill in that data as they examine those traps. Now I'm talking about this in the aspects and the kind of uh, context of agriculture, but this can be very important for something like putting out traps for feral hogs or for tegu or something like that. So this can this type of concept could be adapted for other types of projects, or even just still in the context of insects. There are traps for emerald ash borer. There are traps for other types of invasive insects. So working with these different groups, we've um, fixed these forms to fit their specific needs. Uh, okay. And then finally, what I wanted to talk about with regards to data coming in are revisits. Now, Jerry and Kevin are going to talk about data coming in through revisits through the EdMaps Pro app. And one of the things that Aaron is probably going to also talk about is how those revisits kind of changed the dashboard and changed the map and changed what the data looks like to the people collecting the data and to the um, people who subsequently look at that data. So Revisits can happen through the EdMaps Pro app, but there are um, a couple other ways that revisit data can occur. So if I go back to the home page, and I'm just going to scroll down and I'm just going to pick a record here. So looking at an individual record, and this one has either private selected, so there's no map, or this was entered as a county level re record to begin with. At the top right, there is revisit record. That is a link. So I can click on that link and it will take me to a revisit form to revisit that exact record and say, this is what the status of that population is now. So that's one way to get to revisiting a record and anybody can revisit any record. Otherwise, if I'm revisiting one of my own records, I might find it to be easiest to in my EdMaps, click on my reports, and every reviewed and public record has a revisit option. So I can say, oh, you know, I want to revisit this calorie pair record of mine. <laughs> They're everywhere, I swear. If I want to, I can click revisit. No, it looks the same because it's a, a very similar form. I can revisit this record now. And again, just fill out the information and click submit report. And there are some additional options of, of fields you, you might have seen, might not have seen before. And this just goes back to the different types of forms that our records can be submitted on. And then finally, another way that records can be revisited is if I go to, I'm still in my EdMaps. If I click on EdMaps Pro Tools, there's bulk revisit. So this was, I believe, a request from our Colorado partners, or at least they were most enthusiastic about this concept. If I click bulk revisit, and I always have to read the instructions because I just so rarely use this tool. It's mainly in, in these types of settings. Zoom in on the area on the map, click on the search icon to search for records in that area, and then draw a polygon around the records you want to revisit. So, oh, that's right. Zoom, zoom, zoom. So let's zoom in. Here's Fullwood Park again. So that Fullwood Park is where I before had that uh, KML drawn. So search. And then let's say that I was in Fullwood Park recently and I just 
made sure that everything in here was treated. So table below has filtered to only include the selected points. So if I scroll below, these are the records that are included in that area. Also, we have where you can upload a KML, similar to what I showed you before, and that'll be the polygon that's selecting the records. I can pick the records that I'm saying I revisited. So let's just pick everything in the table. And this is the bulk revisit form for those records. I can say I treated it, I treated it on this day, and these are the comments I have about that particular treatment. So this is a way if you have, say, a, a, a crew going out to a particular park, wildlife area, just doing, you know, treatments along roadsides, you can upload those polygons or you can draw those polygons. And instead of having to do one by one revisits, either through the web or through the apps, you can essentially lasso an area and say those are the the um, records that were revisited on that day. Those are the different ways that you can essentially get data in to EDMAPS, either one by one or several records at a time, either through, <laughs> through bulk uploads or in this case, bulk revisits. I have about four minutes, I believe. So that should be time for questions. Thanks for giving us that overview. I definitely learned a lot about how we can report and all the updates. So we did have a question asking whether it's easy to pull data for reporting purposes. So if you could create a static map with the project activities and data that you could download, is that something people can do? So that, that sounds like uh, requesting data and that'll be a topic I get into later when I talk about the, the various kind of tools and training and features and all that. So if I go to the EdMaps homepage, or if, again, if I go to the tools page, there's EdMaps query, and that's where you can download verified data. So that, if in case that person can't stick around for my next presentation, that's where you can query the data that you are interested in to download it, to do your own reporting. Um, another feature that um, I'll talk about in a little bit is the dashboard. So on the EdMaps dashboard, I think I have one up somewhere. The dashboard is a place where you can filter the data less finely. So there are less options for filtering, but you can get graphs and maps and all that kind of stuff and download those graphs and charts and statistics and everything into a PowerPoint itself directly. So those are two options really for kind of getting data out getting records out or getting a summary of the records out. So Mark, you're saying, I'll admit I still use treated for records I didn't treat, but I know they have been treated by partners. Is this cool or should I just do revisit and report damage? If you know it's being treated, like you know it's treated, it's, it's okay to use that it's been treated. If you just suspect something has been treated, that I would say just do a normal positive revisit and you can note in the comments it's possible it was treated. But if you know something has been treated and you know that person isn't um, using EdMaps or reporting to EdMaps, it's okay if, if you're essentially kind of reporting that it's treated on their behalf. Um, and so someone did ask about um, bulk reporting. So the, the bulk reporting option is really only in the context of that bulk upload. So again, that data upload I was telling you about, we don't have like where you can drop a whole bunch of points in one go and say all of these different points are something. You can report a polygon and say this area is infested. Um, um, there is an option and, and um, Tristan or um, Jerry and Kevin might talk about it, where if you are reporting plants through the app, you can report multiple plants in a polygon. Um, but you have to be really careful with that because it's all of the information on that one record for those multiple plants 
is being applied to all of those records that go in because each record of EDMAPs in EDMAPs is one species at one location on a particular date by a person. So if you're reporting at a vacant lot that there are 10 invasive species there, which is highly possible, I've seen those around our town. You want to just say in this on this vacant lot, so in this polygon, there are these 10 species. Every other piece of information that you apply to that record is being applied to those individual 10 records. You can, after the record's saved and it's in the upload queue, you can edit each individual record if you want to. But again, you need to make sure you do that to make sure that the information is accurate. Thank you. That's great. So we now do have um, our 10 minute break. So we're going to pull up some slides and updates for everyone to watch during the break. All right. Welcome back, everyone. And we are ready to start our next presentation. So right now we have Tristan Hansford with the UGA Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health, and he will be showing us how to use the EDMAPS app. So welcome, Tristan. All right. So we're going to start with, I'm going to share my phone screen here, since that's where the app is located. Okay, so my name is Tristan Hansford. I also work with Rebecca and Chuck, and we're going to start with just a basic tour of the EdMaps app, and then we'll go through some of the ways that you can actually use the app, right? So to start with, when you first download the EdMaps app, I'm hoping most of you are familiar with this at least a little bit already, so hopefully this will just be a little bit of a review for you. But when you first download the EdMaps app, when you open it up, it's going to prompt you to log in. And when you do that, you should wind up looking at the home screen here. Now, another little disclaimer, um, it is going to look just a little bit different depending on whether or not you downloaded the app from the iOS app store or the Google Play app store. So it's going to look a little different if you've got an iPhone versus an Android. Um, but overall, it's going to be more or less the same. So hopefully this shouldn't be all that confusing. So when you log in, you're going to start off with the home page, which is this page here. And so this is where you would start a report for a species. And it is also where you've got a little bit of a field guide, right? If you were to click on the plants, these are a list of the plants that are currently reportable in EdMaps for whichever uh, project that you fall under. So here in Georgia, where we are, we fall under the Southeastern Early Detection Network. So any species that is reportable for pretty much most of the Southeast is gonna be reportable for me on EdMaps. So if you are located in Alaska or 
California, somewhere out west or even parts of Canada, right? Your species lists are going to be a little different because that's a different project that you're falling under. So through this little field guide that we've got, you can click on uh, some of the different species and see a few different representative pictures that are available. So these can help with going over the identification of or uh, teaching folks what they look like, where to find them, stuff like that. And you can click on the details page below it. And most of these species that are in here are going to have a description. Most of the time it's going to be identification characteristics. Sometimes it's going to include the ecological threat at the bottom or the damage that it might cause. Just another cool aspect of the app. And then once you've got, if you have a set of species that you see all the time or are reporting all the time, you can actually go into that little field guide section and tap on the star that should be in the upper right hand corner of your screen right there. I just activated it. So, all right, I guess it wants me to log back in, but that is where you can add that species to your favorites, right? So once we close back out of that, go over to the home page again, and it will be under my, your My Species list if it successfully adds, but it's just been a minute since I've logged in and it wants me to do it again. So a matter of fact, let's just go ahead and do that really quick. Cool, I've logged in again. Um, again, this is the home page. This is where you'll be able to report species from, and this is also where you've got that little bit of a field guide. But if you click on the three bars in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, it's gonna open up the menu, right? Um, and that top button is the home, which is where we just were. The My Species list is below it. So that's where those species that are going to show up if you've favorited them. But this is also where you can change your state of providence. So if I were to leave Georgia and go to Florida, right, and I want to start reporting some species in Florida while I'm there, I would go in and change my current state or providence that I'm in to Florida. And then those species will start to fall under the project that Florida is a part of if it's different than the one that I'm currently in. So it's going to change the species that are reportable for you in EdMaps, uh, but you should really only have to do that if you go to a different state. It should default to where you are currently at if you log in for the first time or start your account there, or it might even ask you for it. I'm not, I can't quite remember, but it's really simple to change it. And so the EdMaps login is directly under the change your state of providence. So this is where you would come in and create an account if you don't have one already, or you would log in if you already do have one, um, and so on and so forth there. And then underneath that, we have the settings. So this is where you can update your species list. So if you haven't updated your species list in a while, it should update automatically. Um, with everything else that we've added to those projects as reportable for you. But if something's not showing up that you were trying to report, you can refresh that species list and see if it shows up. And if not, you can reach out to any one of us and we'll get it added so that it's reportable for you. It does happen that people try to report a species that is relatively new to the area or just wasn't really on the radar and it's not reportable in EdMaps for whatever reason. So reach out to us. We'll make sure that it's reportable for you. We'll, we'll get that uh, squared away. You can also update your area units, right? So this is going to correlate directly with the reporting page. So if you're used to your measurements and units being in standard versus metric, you can change that there. You can also add that if you are using the app to report in the field and taking pictures of those species directly through the EdMaps app, you can make sure that those uh, images safe to your camera roll there as well. And then you can select auto upload and we'll get into sort of the importance of that as well in just a second. And there's also the reminders for the queued reports and I'll get into what that is in just a minute too. And then beneath that is the project that wherever, whatever state you're in pulls from. And so you can manually refresh those species there as well. All right, so the rest of this, this is a feedback button below the settings page. So if you run into an issue with the EdMaps app, feel free to fill this out and send it to us and we'll look at it and go from there. This is a pretty good place to put things like, you know, 
the app's not working when I do this for whatever reason, or if there's a species you wanted to report, but it's not reportable, you can put that information in there. And then below that is just the about. So this is about EdMaps, basically what the app is, where it came from, what we're hoping to, to have it do. And there's also a little bit of information on how the app works and where the data goes and stuff like that. So feel free to check that out. All right, but going back to the home. So this is the basic functionality of this app, which is what we wanted it to do, which was allow people to submit reports uh, that go into the EdMaps database. So it's pretty, pretty simple. So <clears throat> you click on the report new siding button there. And to start off with, it's going to ask you to pick a species, right? For our purposes, we're just going to pick one alligator weed to show how this works. I'm not actually going to submit this report, but you can add multiple species here too. If you are putting in a polygon or just a county level, you can just say, I found multiple species right here. And so just to show how that works, we'll put in anchored water hyacinth as well. Right. Um, and to add an image, you click on the, the camera icon there. And you can either take a photo directly from the app here, which is what I was talking about earlier. If you have that bar turned on, that will save these images to your phone. It'll save it to your phone here as well. Or you can select it from the library. Since I'm not in the field about to take pictures of anything, we're just going to pick a random one. And for our purposes, we're going to choose this fishing lure here that I was trying to identify. And then below that, you can add as many pictures as you'd like. The more pictures, usually the better for our verifiers, especially if it's something that we don't see a whole lot of. So take advantage of that if you can. And below that, this is where the GPS coordinates come into play. This is where you are reporting that species to. Now, you, if you mark private, it's only going to appear as a county uh, record. So if you're reporting on private land, or your own land and you don't want that point to be visible to, to, to everybody, you can mark it private. Uh, from there, <clears throat> if the coordinates for this report are wrong. So usually when that happens is I took a picture of a plant yesterday and I identified it today as something invasive and I want to report it, but I'm no longer right in front of that plant. I can upload this picture to the EdMaps app right here, select the species that it is, and then I can click on that map icon right there below GPS location. So that's going to show me right where I am, and that's our office here. But if I wanted to move it to where I actually saw that species, I just scroll over to where it was, tap the screen where I want that point to be, and it redrops that point to wherever I tell it to. But also, if I wanted to draw a polygon, all you've got to do is tap the corners of where you want to draw that polygon. And it should complete itself once you've got at least three different points there. And once it's done, you just tap the done button. And there it is. My point, my report now has a polygon associated with it. So down to report status, there's positive, treated, and negative. So positive means I saw this plant. I did not do anything to remove this plant. Um, it is still there to the best of my knowledge. Treated means I saw this plant and I did something to remove or control this plant. I treated it with herbicide. I manually pulled it up, something like that. Negative means I looked for this plant and I could not find it in this spot. So that's what those different report statuses generally mean. And the time spent in minutes is usually something more associated with an actual survey. So I went to this half acre plot and I looked around for five minutes and I did not see any Chinese privet anywhere. That is when I would mark it as negative. That just adds some uh, muscle behind your report, right? And so if I mark it as positive, I can then put in the area that I surveyed and then the density there is approximately how much area within that survey area is taken up by that invasive species or by those invasive species. So the polygon that I drew a few minutes ago is about six and a half acres. If I said 50, 25 to 50% 50 of that was covered in Chinese privet, that's a whole lot of privet. 
Uh, over 50% usually means that stand is just about nothing but that invasive species with a few pockets of something else, right? And then in the notes section in the bottom, this is where you can add any other relevant information for the verifiers uh, to, to, to look at that's associated with that report. So if you marked it treated, you could go in and say, I manually removed this specimen or I treated it with this certain herbicide, you know, so on and so forth. And all of that gets added to the report. So once it's done, you've added all the information that you wanted to this report. You can also change the date and the time associated with this report up at the top as well. So if I took this picture of this plant yesterday, I could change that date to yesterday. But once you've entered all the information that you would like to enter with this report, you would click save. Most of the time, if you're in the field and are getting ready to report a, a number of different things, it's easier to save it to the queue rather than to go ahead and upload it. But if I have just found this one species, it's all I'm really doing. I've got good cell service or I've got Wi-Fi, right? You can go ahead and click upload. But for our purposes, I'm going to show you what the save to queue does. Okay, so I've saved that one report to my queue. And what it's going to do now is it's going to sit there until I get to a point where I'm ready to upload it. So we've done that to assist with folks that are out in the field doing a lot of work where maybe you don't have great cell signal, but you do want to take numerous different reports while you're out there and report them once you get back to a point where it's easier to do that. So if I were to create five different reports, save them all to my queue, they're just going to be sitting there waiting for me. And I come back and I tap on the upload queue. What you can do is you can then open up each report, look at it one more time, change anything if you wanted to. Or you can tap those three bars in the upper right hand corner. Upload all right. So if you just wanted to send all of the reports that you've got in your queue at once, you can click that upload all. If you want to click select for upload. So if you only want to upload a few of them. You're not quite sure about some of the other reports that you've done yet. You want to look at those again or something like that. You can do that. But then you just select the reports that you want to upload and go from there. Or if you know that you have a few that you want to delete, maybe you put in two of them, something like that, to delete the ones that you don't want to upload, you select to delete, and then you select those and then delete them, right? But once you've uploaded them, let's go with, I'm not going to upload this just so it doesn't confuse anybody into thinking there's alligator weed in my office. Um, once you've uploaded them, you can hit clear uploaded, and it's going to clear your queue out, no longer show you the ones right here that you've uploaded and then you're free to move on to the next ones, right? Going back to the settings really quickly, just to, to, to rehash some of these things that we just talked about after looking at our reporting capabilities through the app, that bar right there that allows you to save photos to, up, to camera roll, that's where you've taken pictures using the EdMaps app and you want those pictures to also be saved to your phone for future reference. Um, you can click that. The auto upload for reports is what's going to automatically upload those reports as you fill them out. But I do a lot of reporting from the field, and I'd like to not run my phone battery down trying to report species when I have no uh, cell signal. So I just wait until at the end of the day when I'm back and have good cell reception or Wi-Fi and submit all those reports at once. And so another thing that we ran into was it's pretty easy to submit all those or to build all those species reports, put them in your queue, and then forget to upload them at the end of the day. So one thing that we've implemented is a reminder. So it's a notification on your phone. After a period of time, it's going to say, hey, remember, you've got all these reports waiting in your queue. Maybe you should upload those or look at those and decide if you want to keep them or not, because uh, it's pretty easy to forget those things once you're there. So that's basically it for the EdMaps app. It should be pretty simple, I hope. Hopefully that wasn't too terribly difficult. Let's look at the questions and see. Yes, okay, that's a really good question. So the species list and field guide section, you can sort by uh, common name or scientific name. Well, you used to be able to search by scientific name in the field guide section. But for a new sighting to add a species, if I just wanted to add all plants, 
Let's see. Well, maybe that's something that's only available for the Android apps now, but it used to be you could search by common or scientific name and we'll, yeah, we'll see if we can add that back and get that fixed. So if you do have an Android, it might still be there and it might, uh, or it might not, but we should make sure to get that back in there because that's a really good point for searching by a common name or a scientific name for sure. As far as embedding ed maps into an ArcGIS story map, I don't have an answer for that. That's probably something that Chuck or Rebecca are, are going to be able to answer better than I could. And yes, the field guide should be available even when working without cell service. I think that's great. I think um, we we'll probably move on to Rebecca's presentation now, but Tristan, if you are able to type any yeah. answers to questions in the meantime would be fabulous. Uh, I know there's a few more coming in after people have watched uh, your presentation. So I, we're going to welcome back Rebecca Wallace now to talk about EdMaps on the desktop. Yeah, so you can keep asking those questions in the Q&A, and uh, some of those we'll answer at the end. We do have 30 minutes, I believe, at the end set aside for questions and answers, and then um, Chuck and some other people are answering the questions in the Q&A as well. So I'm going to be talking mainly about our revamped tools page and some of the features that exist there. I'll also briefly mention about the training page that is to come. So, so I'm on the main homepage. I scrolled down a little bit. This features section is a new block that we added and updated very, very recently. And so this whole block is also, if you go to our tools page, that is the same block there. So you can access this section either way. So several of these things are also other ways to get to other sections of the website. So report sightings takes you to that same report sightings page I told you about earlier. The EdMaps app link takes you to that same screenshot that Chuck showed in his presentation about accessing the two primary EdMaps apps, the EdMaps app and the EdMaps Pro app. I showed you earlier about the data upload, and we're going to go over the EdMaps brand in a later presentation. So just some of the things, I, I don't have time to go over every single one and click on every single thing, so I'm just going to pick a, a few, several of these and talk about them just to make sure, again, like Chuck mentioned, these are some tools that we want to make sure people know they exist. And especially for some of these, people knew they exist, but we moved them or maybe slightly renamed them. So the uh, maps section is the same as the maps section up here. So if I am just going to open that in a new one, click on that, it takes you to our distribution, what was previously called distribution maps page. We made it look prettier. And then we also uh, updated this. So this is for custom maps and queries. If you That is a clickable icon, and it takes you to what was previously call, called our advanced query tool page. And then again, these are the same species that have been there for a while. And so these are our normal distribution maps page. I'm just going to show you a couple of these. So I'm going to pick on Leafy Spurge. I like Leafy Spurge. So if I click on the county distribution maps for Leafy Spurge, you see there's a bunch of buttons at the top and then our um, presence map for Leafy Spurge at the bottom. Something that's uh, new, I don't think it was around at the last EdMap Summit, but there's two different shades of green now. So let me actually pick the Gustrum to show you what that means, what these two different colors of green mean. So privet, some of those look very similar. So you're going to see something, this will be a, a similar type situation if you look up the knotweeds, the Rhinutria spa. So your Japanese giant and your uh, hybrid knotweeds. So you see it has fewer buttons. <laughs> But what this means, what this top legend up here means, the darker green, the subject, so in this case, Ligustrum spa was reported. The lighter green 
subject reported from child taxa means that this subject itself, Ligustrum spa wasn't reported, but some child taxa, so a species, a subspecies, a variety, if you're higher up in the taxonomic tree, so if this is a family, it could be the genus or the species or so forth, some child of that subject was reported in that county. So if we look here closer, you see there's the light green that's taking up most of Indiana compared to the dark green that's taking up well, a lot of the other areas of the country. That means that in Indiana, most of these county records are coming from a species or subspecies only. Whereas this darker green means that at least once in these counties, um, so going back to our leafy spurge map, there is little to no data that's going to be reported from child taxa. You see a little bit of it up here in Ontario. So there are some subspecies reported up there, but for the most part, a little bit down in California, most of these are coming from this subject, this species level. And then as Chuck mentioned earlier, we added the inhabit button. So that takes you to the inhabit map for the species, Euphorbia escula. <coughs> And then we also have future range, future certainty, and future abundance. So if we click on, I'll just pick um, future range. This takes you to a model that was done by someone other than us, but the data is housed in EdMaps. And you can see where this species is expected to be in the years 2040 to 2060. The information on this map, so I clicked on that I, tells you about the, the project that created this data set. And it's similar with future certainty and future abundance habitat. Those eyes will tell you what these maps are. Now, not every subject are, are going to have future range, future certainty, future abundance, or the inhabit maps, as you saw with the Ligustrum spa map. These four buttons didn't exist. So you can just play around with those again. That eye is where you're going to find information about that. So if we go back to the tools page, so that was our maps, the EdMaps query, if I click on that, it'll take you to these semi-new, several months old at this point, advanced query tool. We've changed the name, it's EdMaps query now, which means I need to update this document. <laughs> I've been spending some time recently updating our training materials. So this page, and again, you can get to it from that tools page or you can get to it from the home page. It's the EdMaps query link. If you click on EdMaps query, it takes you to this page. This walkthrough here at the top tells you what every field is, what every option is that you can use to try and get a data set as close to what you need as possible. So if you're doing a report or doing some sort of summary on what species are happening, being reported, being found in a particular area, between particular dates, things like that, that's where this advanced query tool comes into play. You can play around with these filters. You can also open up even more filters with the advanced option at the top here. And you can see even more filters, but these are filters or parameters that can be applied to get you as close to the data set as you want. It starts out with a basic query of what's been reported that's positive and treated for the last month in Canada and the US. So this is all reviewed data that's coming through. <clears throat> and you can see what's come through in the last month. We've had about 2,500 <laughs> records. And so you can build this query. And as long as it's under 200,000 records currently, you can then download that data set. And over on the right here, you can download it as a CSV, <coughs> a KML, or a shapefile. If it's under 10,000 records, as this one is, you can download, you can save this query. And so I've saved that query. That query will now show up in my EdMaps, and this query will also be able to be used in the EdMaps Pro app, and that's something that Jerry and Kevin can talk about later. 
So if you have a report you're running regularly, every month, every quarter, every year, you can save that query. And instead of having to rebuild it every time, you can go into My Edmaps and go to My Saved Queries. And uh, it's probably on the next page. There's last month. And you can just click on that and it runs it again. <laughs> so the next thing I want to talk about, let me back it up here. We have Species Locator. So if I click on that, I'm going to open it in a new tab again. There are currently three um, pages we have where you can see data in a different way based on other types of boundaries. So getting summaries of those data. So if we click on congressional district, here are the, these congressional districts are not the most up-to-date ones. We know that there's some conversations happening about certain congressional districts. So we have not updated these for the most recent ones. But if we click on uh, congressional district eight in Georgia, which is I believe the one we're in, <coughs> this is going to give us a list of the species and the number of those records for those species that have been reported in this partic particular congressional district. So you can take this list and talk to someone and say, look, invasive species are a problem. Going back to species locator, status of species, we're going to click on this and then I'm going to pick Georgia because that's where I am again. And this is a list of the species that you can say in Georgia. Again, it's the number of records and the number of counties that have those species in them. You can even go down to county. So if I pick Tift, these are the species that have been reported in Tift County. Again, this is reviewed records. Let's say I just cared about plants. I can remove the extra uh, taxa I'm not uh, concerned with. And now this is just the list of plants. Species distribution by other geographic locations. If you have a park, a forest, a wildlife refuge, things like that, you can see if we have that those boundaries and you would get a, a small map and a list of the records in those uh, other geographic locations. So just make sure if you work at a, a type of, of place that isn't a, you know, a state or a county or something like that, we may have that type of boundary, that forest, that park in our uh, data set that you can use to uh, see what's going on there. Um, so quickly, species info, that was something Chuck was talking about earlier. We're revamping that. Species listing. So these are where you can see lists that we have added to edmaps and to invasive.org. So you can see, let's just pick Virginia. They've got lists. These are the lists that we're aware of for Virginia. Some of these are going to be older. Some of these are going to be newer. Some of these might need to be updated because sometimes things change. But you can click on these. Let's look at Virginia noxious weeds. And this is the list we have for the Virginia noxious weeds. And you can see right now we have eight, but that may again need to be updated. So just let us know if you go through and you see we have a, a list that needs updating, just send us an email. Um, so again, that's on that uh, species listing page. A dashboard and tools, I went ahead and opened that. This is what I was talking about earlier. So you can get some very interesting information from here. You can set your dates. You can set your locations. If you want to include or exclude bulk data or different types of taxa, you can get bar graphs and charts and all kinds of stuff. And then in the top right here, you can download these into a PowerPoint. So that's something really interesting that we added maybe a year or so ago. Uh, so definitely take time to, to play around with this. The other way you can reach this dashboard is if you go to My Edmaps and click on Dashboards and click on Edmaps Dashboard. We also have your own dashboard, which is your reviewed records. And if you are a verifier, there's a verifier dashboard in case you weren't aware of that. We do have a way for you to see graphically what you've been reviewing. We also have Chuck mentioned earlier that you could look up who the verifiers are. So if you click on directory, you can uh, look up report verifiers. You can look up if there are expert reporters and you can look up testing labs. So we do have some testing labs for things like 
rose rosette disease that are participating in the review process. <clears throat> And then we also have EDMAPS predictor. So these are those models I was telling you about earlier. So we have those future range of future certainty maps, future abundance habitat maps. You can go there, click on these, and see the species that we have those types of maps for. Yeah, that's another way of getting to those particular types of maps. We also have the invasive range expanders listing tool on here and the inhabit tool uh, listed on here as well. And then finally, I want to briefly mention about the training page. So Chuck mentioned it earlier. So we are just getting started on loading these articles in here, but we are going to have updated versions of the training materials on here. But we also are going to have troubleshooting articles and like little how-to articles as well. This is also where we're going to have access and links to the PowerPoints that are being updated or have been updated things like that. So here's a question we got earlier about the EdMaps app. The species I want to report isn't in the EdMaps app. I found species I want to report, but it isn't showing up in the map. And then here are some solutions we have on what you can do to check to see if you can fix that quickly. So we're going to have different kinds of things, all kinds of very new material that we're going to have available. And then finally, the last thing that we are going to also have is, if I go back here, the EdMap Studio. So if I click on that, these are some of the maps that are being created by projects in like Ag Pest Monitor, some of the stuff Chuck was talking about earlier. But we're also going to be adding, oh, look, we already added some EdMaps data by county. We're going to be adding some other types of tools where you can pick and drop in different species. So this is a map where we're looking at Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly locations. So yellow is where Tree of Heaven's found, blue is where Spotted Lanternfly is found, and green is where both are being found. So these types of maps are going to be more easily able to be created by you. So this is something we're working on creating a tool where you can very easily pick your parameters and the map is created. Here's another one where it's looking at, in this case, a biocontrol agent on two different subjects of host. So this is showing where the host is, where the biocontrol agent is, and, and both. So that's just a brief overview of our new tools slash training page. And again, I'm rushing to the end. <coughs> I'm trying not to step on your toes, Jerry, I promise. So that was great. There are a couple of questions if you want to go through in the Q&A. Some of them might be good to leave to the end too when we have everyone here, but let's continue on. So we're going to actually start with Kevin Bailey from the Utah Weed Supervisors Association. So I'll welcome you to share your screen and begin your presentation. All right. So again, my name is Kevin Bailey. We're going to work off of edmaps.org because a lot of this that you're going to use on EdMaps Pro starts with the very beginning of using it on edmaps.org. And so as we go through this, we're gonna run through some of those same pages that Rebecca just showed us so that you guys will be able to see exactly what you've got to set up on edmaps.org so that it transfers over to EdMaps Pro. And so we're gonna start right there at that beginning stage, make sure you sign in. We're gonna work off of the My EdMaps. So if we click on My EdMaps, it pulls up that same page right here and we're gonna work kind of down this. We just kind of went over the dashboards. Rebecca did an outstanding job on explaining what that is and why we have it. And really, you know, I wanna talk about just a little bit about my dashboard is, is that a lot of the data that I put in, I can pull that information myself. You know, I'm out there and I'm taking that data with EdMaps Pro and it auto-generates my dashboard right here, and I can quickly pull that information if I need. So the next thing that I want to talk about is when you're out there using, whether it's the EdMaps app or the EdMaps Pro app, your reports go here, as well as your revisit. So you can go ahead, you can view them, you can edit them, uh, do whatever you need to do right here, and this is where it all goes. As soon as it gets verified, if it's a new point, it's got to be verified. If it's a My Revisit, it doesn't have to be verified because somebody's already previously done that. Uh, again, Rebecca touched on the bulk uploads and went through that. And you can also, you know, if you've done a download before, you can look, hey, I've done that before. Maybe I already have that information. 
So the first thing that we've got to set up on this is my species list. Uh, and again, this here starts the process for the EdMaps Pro app. And so as you can see here, I can add an individual species with this list and I can go through and add each individual and then it, and then it starts to auto populate here down below or I can specifically have a, a species list that's already added here in edmaps.org. I can go ahead and click that and then it adds that list down here into this bottom query here. Again, one thing that I really like is if I'm out in the field with my EdMaps Pro app and say I'm going to be mapping hoary crest, I can hold down on hoary crest and I can move that species to the top. So if I'm out there and I know that I want that to come right up to the top of my list, I can do that. Now, one way that I use it is that I have my kind of those five top lists those species that I have that I map, it seems like constantly, I try to keep them in that top five so that I can easily, it's just easily when I go to press that and you'll see that in with Jerry is I can press that and it automatically, it's just right there, easy for me and easier for the user. The next thing that will auto populate onto EdMaps Pro is my saved queries. Rebecca touched on this a little bit and it really helps with the new advanced query tool page. Uh, so what we want to do here is we want to create a new data set. So this is specifically, if I've got a project going on or a specific weed, I'm going to go and I'm going to create this because when I create it here on edmaps.org, it's going to transfer over to, and I can be able to toggle that on and off on the EdMaps Pro app. So if I click the create new data set, it's going to pull up that advanced query page. And I'm not going to go through everything because uh, Becca did an outstanding job uh, on that. You, you put in your date, you can put in your species. And then when you press the save query, it shoots you back to this page and it automatically it saves it right in there. Now you're going to see something similar on your EdMaps Pro app. Uh, now, again, you can't delete it from your EdMaps Pro app. This is where you delete those is, is in the edmaps.org portion of this. Uh, the other two things over here on the left, uh, projects I'm not going to hit on, but I, I really wanted to hit on uh, the alerts. And Chuck kind of alluded to a little bit on the alerts. And this is one of the things that as the state of Utah, it, it kind of drew us to this because we wanted to know what was going on and around our borders. We had the data. And, and a lot of the people around our borders have data. And if there's something that comes in that, that I don't have, or either our state doesn't have, and it comes into our state, you can create an alert here for yourself. And it comes in an email form, and it makes it simply easy for you to be able to say, hey, he's up. maybe I better go and check this out. This is kind of close to my border. So what I have is I have it set up for the state of Utah, and then I also have it set up for specific counties that are adjacent or surrounded my counties. And then I get an alert. If there's something on my border that I don't have in my county and it's getting close, maybe I better get out there and look. And so this is really a really good thing. It doesn't really have anything to do with EdMaps Pro unless somebody's out there taking that data and it ends up getting in your borders or, or close to your borders. But I just wanted to, to touch on that. You can also request to be a verifier on this side, and, and I'm not going to go into the admin tools. So the next portion down here is the EdMaps Pro tools. This is where you, this first one is my county list. And what you're doing is this has to do with your data here that will be transferred over onto EdMaps Pro. Now, what I've went ahead and done is I've got the data from all of the counties that surround me. Uh, so that I have their data so that if I'm working right there next to that border and I'm seeing something, you know, I can be able to say, hey, oh, it's already been mapped right here. I don't need to map it. And so I have all of those borders. Now, you don't have to have them all on, which Jerry is going to show you when he gets to that portion of EdMaps Pro. Uh, but again, this is where you create that. You add the county uh, and then you again, you can only delete it. Uh, right here on this app. And again, it shows up. You don't have to download it on your EdMaps Pro. It gives you the option of, of downloading it, but you do have the capability of, of having multiple data sets that are associated with you as the user, and it pulls up on your map every time you pull up. The next thing is the photo projects. 
So photo projects is something that has to do with monitoring that we can use through EdMaps Pro. So you can create that here on uh, edmaps.org and you can also create one on EdMaps Pro and then everything is housed here on edmaps.org. And so I can go ahead, I can download these images here. You know, if I need some of those pictures for a presentation or something like that, or if I need to hand in a report, I can pull all of those monitoring sites into this and I can download those. One nice feature about this is we have lots of users that go out that work in my county. I can have the ability to share these projects with other users. And then they can, if they're out there and they can see where we have those on the map and they can go ahead and take that after photo or, or they can start a new one either way, which makes it very, very user friendly and, and functionality is really good. Again, remember, you can only delete them here. You can't delete them on the app itself. So everything's kind of housed on edmaps.org, but it also crosses over to the edmaps pro app and, and you can see them in that list when, when Jerry pulls up that portion of the app. So project areas. This also has the ability to be able to be shared between users. And strictly uh, the way that we've used this a little bit is if we have a project going on, specifically between Jerry and myself, and we have our team out there working in an area, we can go and we can have a KML and have it started and we can upload that in here. We can choose a file, we can upload that KML, and then it comes back into this list down here. We also, Jerry, along with Chuck, we've been able to do some of our roads. So if we get out into, we have lots of area, Jerry and myself do, is that we don't have cell service. And so if you get out in some of the areas, you, you can't see the roads. All you can see is just your points. Uh, you can't pull up a topographical map, anything like that on EdMaps Pro. Uh, we have something set up so that I, I have uh, a KML of the roads uh, that, that Jerry and Chuck helped get onto here. And so we can see those roads or those areas, and then we can kind of figure out where you're at uh, as you're out there mapping. We can also draw a KML. Specifically, if we have guys or a team working in this area, we can draw, and I'll show you this portion right here. So if I draw a KML, it's gonna pull up and I'm gonna name that layer. And then it's really, really user-friendly. You can select the polygon tool, then you draw your polygon like you do on other interfaces. And then once you draw that, it's created. And then you just have to make sure that once you do that and you want to share that, you've got to be able to press that share. And then it's going to pull up so that you can add those other team members that are going to be out there mapping in this area. You just have to make sure that you add them so that, th that everybody has that polygon that you want them working in. And kind of the last thing that I wanted to touch on, and then we'll turn it over to Jerry here is, and Rebecca kind of alluded to this and, and went through this whole process. We use bulk revisits when we do aerial applications. And so you can see kind of, I've drawn this polygon here and I've gathered up this data here and you can see that they're red and they're positive points, which means we know that they're there, but we wanna be able to change all of these points to treated. Uh, and it's just one of those handy tools that we can. Now remember with this, and I don't think Rebecca touched on this is that you can only change these points to either being positive, treated, eradicated. You, you cannot change the density or the acres that are associated when you do a bulk revisit. And I just wanted to just make that clear is that if you're gonna have to change those other attributes that are associated with your point data or with your polygon data, you have to do that individually. You won't be able to do that as a bulk revisit. And so with that, I want to give Jerry plenty of time to be able to make sure that we were able to go through and answer questions on EdMaps Pro. I think out of those hours spent that Chuck showed everybody, I think Jerry and I and our teams put in a lot of those hours just trying to help generate and, and get the EdMaps Pro going over the years and up and running so that, the, that it's user for everybody across all interfaces. Again, with that, I'll turn it over to Jerry. All right, okay. A little history, we've been working with Chuck for at least a dozen years now, I would guess. This didn't happen overnight. It's been a labor of love for all of us involved. Anyway, there's a lot to this. We're just probably gonna scratch the surface. A lot of stuff is similar 
to this as the EdMaps app also. So I might gloss over some of this, but anyway, questions later if you want. So anyway, okay, same thing. You're gonna download this off of your app. They do look a little different between Android and Apple. So you can download it and open your app. And uh, <clears throat> now when you set this up and you log in or you make a new one and it asks you for the first time, allow to send and allow to use while you're using your app, allow it. It's not like you get a whole bunch of emails and a whole bunch of stuff. You get things that pertain to what you're doing in that only. So always allow it. It will save you headache in the long run. So anyway, log into it. Your first startup screen is the one here on the left. You'll end up with whatever you ended up with last as far as, you know, where you're at. All of the screens have a little button up here, the little uh, question mark, and it'll tell you what the page has. It'll answer questions like what all these, what do all these colors of the points mean? Okay. So anyway, we'll start over here on the right. You'll click on this little drawer, the little hamburger icon. This is your app settings on this side of it. It's you, what you're looking at originally is the invasive map. So we're going to go to the photo projects first. Okay, so on your photo projects, these are points that are all about the photo for documentation of what you're doing. We added this function a couple of years ago to it. So you're going to create a folder in the app, or you can create one on the website. But you're going to create the project, which is a folder that's going to house all of your points. So you're going to have a photo point, multiple points, one point, multiple points in the folder. Then you can handle one photo or multiple photos in each point in that. Kind of a, a storage system similar to what you would find on a computer. So anyways, you'll put a picture in. And your little plus sign, you can add more photos. And when you go back to add a photo to the same point, it's going to ask you which one you want to overlay. And I just got an example here, and it will ghost the photo behind you. So when you navigate yourself back to the point, you will actually ghost the photo behind it so you can recreate it. Now, the reason for the uh, portrait photo is so you can put them side by side. We had an option, one or the other, portrait or landscape, and it was better off to have them side by side. So it's a good tool to use. This is all about the photo and nothing to do with the weed, but it's embedded in this so you can actually document it. You can share these also, just like the projects, you can share these with other people. So you don't have to have multiple places where you go to find them. It's all there for you. So. Kind of a neat tool to have. Okay, here's your county data sets that Kevin showed you. When you set it up, this is mine. I have all my surrounding counties. I have a couple in Nevada and the rest are all in Utah because I do border two counties in Nevada. And there's the little box with the download arrow in it. That's what it'll start out like. When you click that, then you end up with the refresh button. You got to keep in mind when you download these, it's just a snapshot in time. So as soon as you do anything else in it, you have to upload and then refresh these screens. Then there's a trash if you don't want it on your device anymore. And then here's the off and on, turn it off and on. It's not a good idea to have all these on because that would be a whole lot of data and it would really bog and slow down your machine. So the next one's your saved query they talked about. Same thing, you're on and off button, trash it. If you don't want it, refresh it. When you refresh it, it goes back to the servers and downloads a fresh copy. It'll add new data that gets put in your specific query. Also, that's one thing to keep in mind. And all of these have a refresh button that will refresh these lists. If they didn't do it by themselves, it will force it to go back to it and find your query. Okay, next is the project areas Kevin talked about. Here's your same thing. You're, you, you've got a download button. You've got the trash button. You've got the turn it off and on button. But there's also this, uh, it's a zoom to centroid button. 
Now, when you do add one of these in there, it will ask you, where do you want your centroid? Do you want it in the center of your project? Do you want it at the end? You get to pick where the centroid of it is. So it's quite a handy thing to have when you're, you know, like Kevin said, we have a lot of stuff that sometimes it's not fun to have a white screen. You can still take points, do whatever you want to do, polygons, but you always have something, some way of figuring out where you're at sometimes. Okay, then you got the offline stuff, the aerial maps, and you have road maps, which is just a city street map. It's a little, it's a little more, uh, less size wise. The aerial photography has some disadvantages. It has a zoom capability that's not quite so deep. So you're a little bit above the earth. It's hard to zoom in tight and look at it. But the other offline road maps will actually go a little bit better. Okay, so here's the queue. They talked about that. In this app, you have multiple things you're going to do. Everything has a place. You got observations, revisits, your images, and you can also do contest revisit or contest observations in here. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But anyway, so these are your options. They're the same as the other app. They look very similar. You just have different things you can in your upload queue. Okay. Now the last is the app settings. Just a word to the wise, click on this, save your photos. Cause if you ever lose points and something happens, you get a hiccup in a point that didn't work quite right. And you have to delete it and start over. At least you will have the photo. You can add to the same photo to the point later. You know, you refresh your species here. You can send feedback here and send something that happened to you in. And it also tells you these points in the statistics or everything that you have capability of downloading is also there just as a number for you. Okay, all right, now going across the top of the screen, there's that F with a circle around it. These are your filters. So when you want to not see so many dots on the screen, you can filter them out. You can filter them by state list, specific species, observation, revisit dates, or report status, whether you want to see all, you just want to see all positive points, you can click on it and see that. This only new reports and revisits is something new. I haven't played with it for very much, so I'm not going to speak to it. Might be something Chuck can address later. Okay, <clears throat> so now on the other side, you have your app or map settings. The other side was app, this is map. So you can filter through or show state lists only or your state if you have it set up into the system. You can click on Utah and just the Utah weeds, noxious weeds will come up. If not, you can take species, you could click one, you can click 10, whatever you want, you can add to this. And it also tells you how many of these points, weeds, whether they be noxious or not, how many points you have in your data set. So you'll see some of these weeds in here, you know, like cheatgrass or whatever, they aren't on our list clasping pepperweed, but somebody has put one point in my county in this. You can also filter by observation date or last date visited, which is a revisit. You can hide or show in three month increments of what you did. If you don't want to see what you did yesterday, you're going to hide the last three months. So it's not showing up on the screen for the next day. Okay, and then you've also got the status, which I talked about was the positive treated. You're going to select which ones you want to show only on this one. Okay, <clears throat> now on the filtering, if you have something filtered and you look and you see on the screen and you see something you don't think you should be seeing or you don't see something you need to see, chances are you've got filters on and you didn't know it. So you click the clear all filters and it will take them away. Now, the F, you'll notice the F right now is whited out behind. That means you have something filtered. So if you're in this mode right here and you see that white, you'll know something's filtered. Okay, now on the map settings over here, aerial photography, this is where you're clicking them off and on. If you do not need your offline maps, do not turn them on. Only use them if you're out of service. 
Okay, and you'll same way, click them off and on here. You'll have to download them. It does take time to download because they are really there. There, some of them can be, you know, a gig or more for an aerial. My county alone is split into four aerial size or aerial files. So, okay, auto follow. This is a function we added a couple of years ago, so you could keep going with yourself. You have two options on it. You can either keep your direction, which means you're always going up on the screen, or you can have north always up on the screen. Either way you like it, you have the option to do it. If you ever move yourself around on the screen, it quits auto following until you click on the auto locate button, the bullseye on the bottom. Okay. Now under that, you have, what do you want to see? You know, satellite normal, which is a street map, or terrain, which is more of a topo map. That's your three options for when you're in service. Okay. <clears throat> now you have what you're going to display. Now this is where they, the both apps, Android and the iOS, do differ a little bit here. On an iOS, you have to have one, only one on at a time. So you can see your county records. And it will show multiple counties if you want, but that's all it shows. If you select the saved records, which is a, from a query, it will only show those, but it filters it out to what you don't see. These two are the same things, same picture with different things filtered. Okay. Photo projects will only show your photo. It'll have the little camera in the icon photo on it. You can click on these, you can navigate to them once you're here. And that's all, but that's all you'll see. And then for a verifier, whoever happens to verify in your state, your county, they have an option to show unverified. If you click this, you'll show your own, you'll only see your unverified till it's verified. And it'll show just those only, but that's more of a verifier thing. Okay. I got five minutes left to go through this. Maybe oh in. Okay, so now putting new points in EdMaps Pro is similar but a little different than the other app. So you're going to select the plus button. You can select the bullseye to put yourself in the middle of the screen. It comes up with five different options. You can actually walk a polygon now. This is something new that just got added in the last year where you can actually walk a polygon. You can use your location, which you'll Put it wherever you happen to be at. Whether you're there on the screen or not, it'll put you there. You can draw a polygon if you want, or you drop a marker. Now, if you can put points where you're not at, if you would like, it puts it in the middle of the screen. Okay. So if you get it in the middle of the screen, like this third picture over, the white is you'll hold on that for a second and you can move the picture. Okay. So that's the five choices. Then you'll click done or next, and then done. Then you'll come up with a similar screen as before. You'll hit click on the pencil. You'll add your species. Your list comes up. This is where Kevin talked about the order of your species here. Now you don't, you can take these off, move them all the way bottom if you don't want to use them. You can leave them alphabetized. You know, that's the idea. Any device you log into, this all this stuff follows you with it okay then you're going to add a photo if you're not the verifier add photos people that want to verify and want to see pictures you know it's always a good idea to do it um, so you'll do that then you'll scroll down if you need to have to move the point if you're on the wrong side of the road or you're in the field next door and you don't want to jump a fence or whatever you can click on the little map icon here and when you click up that map all you have to do is touch the screen and you can put a point in to move it wherever you want to just touch it it'll have a little blue dot you click OK and it'll leave the dot there same thing down here your density your acres positive treated negative for new points. And down here, you've got a note place for the notes if you need to put what you did, what you treated, what you did, whatever one you want to remember there. Click save and done, and there's your point. Now, polygons are a little bit different if you're doing them, especially if you want to go back and move the polygon. It's something you have to play with, but it's possible. Okay. 
Now on the screen, when you touch a point, you'll come up with a little dialogue box here that says what the species is, the last date, the observation date, last date, who did it, and it'll have two options, view details and report a visit, revisit. So you hit report or revisit, the same similar looking dialogue box comes up. You can add a new picture. You can add multiple pictures. You can add a note, click save. Or scroll down, same thing, add the data. You want to change the attributes, how many acres. It should come up with the acres from the previous or square feet from the previous thing that revisit on it. Then you're going to click save. You're done with the revisit. Now, if you hit the view details, this actually brings this box up that shows you what it is. You can view the revisits from the app, just a list of them, who in what order have done them. On the bottom, you have view records on Edmaps. We'll take you to the website and you can actually see all of the data on it, everything on it. You can actually have it guide you. It'll take you out of the app into Google or Apple Maps. And you've also got this contest record that we talked about. If you know there's something wrong with this, you go to that point and it's the wrong species, it's something else, you can hit contest. This screen on the right will come up and you will have, you have to put something in this to do it. And then you click save. And then it goes to your queue. Okay, I am a couple of minutes early if we had any questions. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Kevin. So yeah, any of our attendees, if you do have specific questions about Edmaps Pro, please do put those in the Q&A. We do have one question regarding the amount of data I believe that you can upload for queries. So someone says whether you can talk about the 10,000 response limit for advanced query. They have some issues with, with large data sets. So I don't know if that's something that you'd be able to answer. The data sets get awful big over that, and they're hard to they're crunch. What was the other question? I, that's a Chuck, probably Chuck. Yeah, I think they're just wondering if that limit is going to increase at all. Chuck, are you able to answer that? Yeah, I mean, it, it was as much, it's, it's primarily when it's going to the phone and just having too much data in a data set can, can cause problems. It's, it's a limit. When you do a safe query, I think the safe query cannot be over 10,000 records. But if, you know, if that needed to go up to 15,000 or something because of a specific need, that's something we could definitely uh, give a try. So there's got to be a limit or those files just get too big when you're trying to move them on to a device primarily. A question about whether it can be downloaded as a geo JSON file, maybe we can answer that too. Yeah, I, I saw that and I was going to um, just follow back up with them. Uh, you, there's not a direct way to do that on the website, but I think we're using a form of GeoJSON to actually do the points on the map. And so with a little bit of looking at the code, you could probably pull it by species. Um, and if there's a specific need for that format to be available to integrate into some other application, then it's always something we can look into. And the, the another question that's in there is about workflow for setting up citizen science training project. And, you know, the honest truth is the tools are all here. You, you can go through and set up a project and handle it that way, or you can just go out and train um, the group that you're working with on using the Edmaps app. And, they can get started and start collecting data and go forward. And that's probably the easiest and best way to do that for now. And yeah. I'll answer that last question, then we can take a break about the proximity alarm feature. No, we have not gotten that in integrated yet. Um, the concept there is that in Edmaps Pro, you're downloading the data normally for an area and you can see it on the map. But in the Edmaps app, if you're out in the field and you had cell phone coverage, being able to hit the server and go, okay, is there a species, is this species already been reported, you know, near where you are? 
And if so, make that a revisit versus making it a new record. And that's something that we've talked about. It We just haven't been able to implement yet. And, and, and that is sort of like pulling the lat long from the picture that you take on your phone versus where you are at the time. That question came up earlier. And just so everybody gets the answer to that, that's something we're looking into. Our concern is that, you know, making it clear which one you use if they're different in terms of where you currently are in the lat long with this embedded into the photo. And just, we don't want to introduce more problems by incorporating that feature and then people report something where it's not actually at. I'd like to welcome Melissa Wilt and Debbie Monfort from the UGA Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health and they will be sharing with us um, a presentation on introducing the EdMaps brand. Welcome to the communications department at the University of Georgia Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. I'm Debbie Munford. I'm Melissa Wilt. And we're fairly new additions here to the center whose reach has gone far and wide. And we're delighted to help share and communicate all the great things going on here, as well as assist our other partner project collaborators. So part of introducing you all to this brand is to build partnerships and awareness. We already have a great foundation of partners that we've worked with and EdMaps has obviously grown in usage in the past years. So strengthening those partnerships is an important part of invasive species management. And right now there are also other channels being utilized and we want to by strengthening partnerships you know streamline the reporting uh, process so that's part of introducing this brand is to help strengthen each other by creating that consistency in um, presenting edmaps as a useful tool Right. And once, you know, you begin using a brand, you know, all the parts that go with it, the, the graphics, the pre part, the colors, the logos, it helps support that visual presence, you know, to your relevant audience it becomes familiar. And by introducing the EdMaps brand and, and moving into a, a place where we are identifying the work behind the scenes, the tool that's being used as we begin encouraging use of that. We're giving an image to the name, just like anything where you get used to, it's synonymous. You know, you hear the name EdMaps and you're going to create that light bulb in your head. Oh, okay, that's the marker point in the EdMaps. So your brand helps increase your visual presence. And by increasing that visual presence, you reinforce the credibility. So one of the benefits of EdMaps is that it is verified reports. And as all of you are credible in your work, it reinforces that credibility as the brand is consistently used and that increase in visual presence happens. And like Debbie mentioned, the whole part reason for branding is when you see a brand, you know what it means. You know that it's credible. You know maybe some partners, organizations, agencies, individuals that utilize it come to mind and that reinforces the credibility as well. Yeah, and you're um, making connections. Correct. And then you also know what to expect when you consistently see the EdMaps brand across multiple channels, print materials, you know, being utilized by all these organizations and agencies. Yeah, you get a little bit of a, you know, quality line there. Correct. So, and then the other thing with that is when you consistently see a brand, you become more aware of it. Like, oh, hey, you know, I'm seeing this more and more. I mean, <laughs> Let's think about our social media feeds. You know, we hit search on something and all of a sudden Facebook knows what we want, what we're looking for, what we, we just purchased on Amazon. So that consistent branding, bringing awareness, you know, helps our audience see something and, you know, your interest gets piqued. Like, ooh, hmm, 
maybe that's something, um, you know, what is that? Can I use that? Is that the, something that's going to help me work smarter? Or, and, and this has been um, talked about a lot today, is there a partnership that makes sense um, to support my project's application? You know, Chuck mentioned in the very beginning that EdMaps was a tool that could support applications to do more. And so if you don't tell anybody about something, they don't know that it's there. So obviously branding something is a great way to create awareness. And by creating awareness and building those new partnerships, the goal is to grow usership. And especially when you are using a tool that relies on individual reports, um, growing that usership can only help those in this field um, that are making decisions and utilizing this data. So it's a twofold as far as usership of increasing data and also usership of partners, you know, collaborating to make tools that help their efforts um, specifically. And so now we're gonna look, Debbie's gonna go into um, the specifics of the brand guidelines, which we'll show you where to find um, at the end of the presentation. Yeah, so a lot of y'all are used to seeing this. The logo was updated back in uh, 2018, so it's not necessarily a new brand or a new logo. There are some old ones out there, and the way to know that it's old is you're gonna miss, you're missing that beautiful marker point, that brick red marker point. Um, so that's the main thing that you're going to look for is um, we, we hope that you'll use our current logo. We do have a, a horizontal primary logo and a square secondary logo. So that's always nice. You can fit different needs, purposes, whatever. EdMaps is available across multiple devices. So like you've seen Tristan give an explanation and a run through today, EdMaps on the phone, and Jerry and his team gave the presentation on EdMaps Pro. So just think about that, where you're using it. And, you know, if you need to be device specific, use those mock layouts there. We do have specific colors. If you want to uh, match something there, so you've got marker red and density green and tagline green, and then good old fashioned black and white. Uh, our logo fonts are fairly standard. Um, most of them are available like in a, a Microsoft Word document, a, you know, Word program. Um, and, and we have those listed should you want to um, be extra <laughs> and match of fonts. As far as style and usage goes, we just, you know, try and stay consistent on um, spelling. Gosh, it's tough for everyone and the struggle is real because typing EdMaps in its correct capitalization, lower cas capitalization, lowercase lettering is challenging. We find ourselves making a mistake there. So it's actually an acronym for Early Detection and Distribution Mapping Systems. So EdMaps is taken from that. So you've got a capital E, capital D, capital D, and then MAP and a capital S. So just trying it, to be consistent in that <laughs> so people know that it's the same tool being used. Right, give your fingers a workout. So in, in this presentation, our style guide, we've given some examples of correct usage and incorrect usage. Um, pronunciation is another thing. We um, we love to hear ed maps. Um, EDD maps is something that happens a lot. We're not too much a fan. Um, and then there's no S in between ed and maps. Um, so um, consistency, awareness, um, you know, just like pronouncing your own name, you, you love to hear it when it's pronounced um, in the way that you usually say it. Do I need permission to use this logo? A lot of uh, entities and organizations, you know, have you fill out this form and then you get the release to use it? No, we're just um, excited to get it out there. We're excited to be a partner. If, if we're helping you work smarter, do your mission do your work, your mission, and carrying into a success, 
please use our logo. We just ask that you maintain its proportions, you know, where you can like make things look like they're squished or they've been sat upon. Just maintain proportions as best you can and don't alter it in any way. Um, it's meant to be used with the find map track tagline. And then, hey, share with us. Let us know that you're using this. Let us share our success in your channels. And so you can either drop Melissa and I an email. You can tag us or um, mention us in social media. Um, we work better when we work together. Right. And it's just, again, creating that partnership of um, marketing each other and our um, goals and efforts um, to just reach more people um, and again, increase that usage um, and awareness. And so incorporating the brand, since EdMaps has grown to where um, it is now, you know, we have the um, drive to create this brand. And so I pulled some older um, screenshots from social media just to show us examples of how we can incorporate this brand moving forward. Um, so again, we love that our partners are mentioning EdMaps and mentioning this tool that they use to report invasive species and just want to enhance it with the brand to create that consistency um, and that visual presence and get the brand in people's minds in invasive species management. Um, so the one, three ways to report invasive species, um, you know, it mentions edmaps um, or da .org or downloading the app, which is great. Um, just adding the logo again for that visual um, presence. And then um, these are social media. So um, as Debbie mentioned, um, hashtagging um, edmaps, a lot of our partners and individuals are already doing that, which is great. If you tag um, the center, that's even better. Um, and so just again, so we can share it and build the networking of and using of this tool. The one on the right utilizes the most recent logo, which is great. And again, just looking at creating the hashtag. Um, and just so you all know, the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health is on the major social media channels. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, X, LinkedIn, you know, so any of those, some of them use hashtags, some of them don't, some of them you can tag, you know, so any way that you can incorporate us so that, because now we are looking for those to share the successes that people utilizing this tool uh, are putting out there. So here are some other examples, you know, join the EdMap community. Again, it's just really easy to, mistype and maps. So, you know, just keeping it consistent with the spelling so that people know it's the same tool. Again, great use of the logo. And in the middle example, just being cautious again with the, the ed maps being all caps, just to ensure that it's the same tool being used. And, but again, having the, the logo there is great. And we do have the new guidelines. These were previous um, device uh, shots that were used, which is fine. Um, and then the last example on the right, one thing to note is social media, especially is extremely visual in the sense that, you know, people like seeing people. You find that the most, just a little marketing one-on-one, -on -one, but the most viewed, shared, tagged, commented on are when actual people are in the photos, you know, making a point of trying to capture people in the field, you know, researchers, individuals, professionals in the field, utilizing the tool um, is great and is, is an extra boost to um, the visual presence of what you're doing um, as an individual or professional or agency. Um, and then also just boosting, you know, the online presence. Um, and this one was great. We had the hashtag, we had the, the, the mention. So again, just it, it's hard to find these. So it's always great to see these and to just keep that in mind. Also, you know, printed materials, posters, rack cards, or items like pens. As Debbie mentioned, you don't need permission uh, to use the logo um, on the website, which we'll show you in a minute. We also have like black and white. Um, so different 
variation of the, the logo, just making sure that um, it, it's visible, it's, it's easily seen in whatever graphic or photo that you're using. Um, so we do have those variations um, if needed. And if you have it on your website, um, you know, just making sure you have the most updated uh, version of the, the logo on any public facing websites or presentations and things like that. So where, where do you find this? As you all have seen, Ed Maps is looking pretty sharp. Um, um, just some, some new graphic content to it, but you'll route to the brand guide from our main homepage at the about section. It's the Ed Maps brand. And down here is just, you know, the who, what, when, why, style and usage, how to spell it, how to say it. <laughs> we have a downloadable brand guide. It's a real simple one pager. It's going to show you what the logo needs to look like. Uh, it has our colors. It has our fonts. Uh, what you see here now is our brand logos, primary and secondary logo. You can tap on the link and you can download it by doing a right mouse click and saving the image. And then we've got some logo variations here for you, you know, black logos and the white, depending on where you're using them. And then a reverse um, logo, which is what you saw in that previous uh, social media post. They use the reverse logo there. So all that's available. We've got a handy dandy, hey, download everything button. So if, if you know you're going to be working with this, please take that and use it with care. Coming soon, we will begin adding like some templates, uh, maybe a social media template, postcards, fact sheets, just so that we can let our partnership shine. Uh, Again, it, it's uh, something that we can cross promote. If we know about you, you know about us, and we can share those successes um, together. Now, if your needs become more than what's on this page and you just have a really detailed request, you're gonna reach out to myself or Melissa and we'll get you what you need. We'll talk with Chuck and you know, maybe it's something that's come out of this summit today and a partnership develops and then we'll just walk from there. Right, or different size and different formats, um, you know, just depending on what you're doing, we're here to help. And that gets us to the end of our brand. You know, we're here. Just give us a shout. Well, thank you both for giving up that presentation. I uh, included the link to that page as well in the chat for folks if they want to look at some of those logos and branding. And we'll move on. So Aaron's here. I'm going to have you share your screen. And Aaron Eagers from the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food and will be presenting on ArcGIS dashboards. I know we had a question about that earlier today. So excited to see your presentation. Well, good afternoon, morning, or evening, depending on where you're from or where you're at, I guess. I'm happy to be able to wrap, be the last presenter. What I want to show is other ways that you use the power of EdMaps. I mean, we've spent all morning looking at all these powerful tools that Chuck and his group has built, the structure of it, the ease of it. Chuck, I really love that first slide or one of the first slides you did that showed, you know, bad data in, bad data out. That is so important to be able to have the data as good data. And what I'm going to go through today is going to show how in Utah we're using the data, how we're using this data in Utah to be able to do marketing with it. And also it helps us when we have either federal funds or state funds, how we're actually using those funds and allocating those funds. I have a whole bunch of tabs, so I just wanna make sure the first one. So when Chuck talked about the importance of having a core data set, I can't stress that enough. There is so much information that you can do once you have a core data set. So in Utah, we once we got our core data set, we started to look at, well, how do we combine this with other elements like our biocontrol, our monitoring? How can we use this actually for me as a state weed coordinator to help 
each one of the 29 counties in Utah do a better job. And so we are able to work with Chuck and his partners to be able to pull live data from EdMaps and be able to show it, and then be able to push this out to the public. And the idea is we want to put everything we possibly can front facing to the public, to our CWMAs, to UDAF's website, everywhere we can that anybody who wants to come and do an analysis of our data and what's happening in Utah, you know, has the ability to be able to do it. I'm going to go through quite a few different iterations of dashboards that we use using the core data from EdMaps and how they link together. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on any of them, but it'll give you a good idea of how you can use the data once you've secured it. So this is just our invasive species dashboard. So these are regulated species in Utah. You can see the colors direct from EdMaps where I can zoom in and look at it, any area and see what's been treated, what's been eradicated and what are new points that are coming in. I can also look at it from year to year to see how I'm doing as a state. Or I can go and filter this really quickly to an individual county and I can look at each of the counties and I'm picking on Jerry on this one to say, how is Jerry doing in his county and be able to zoom in, see what point data is there. And I can even pull this information directly from EdMaps. If I click on a point, this is the actual EdMaps data that was put into EdMaps so I can look specifically on it. In any kind of an ArcGIS dashboard, realize you have the ability to add as whoops, many layers as you want. So if there's something specific to you, to your project, to your county, to your state, even up to a regional area, you can add a lot of different data. And that's what I'm going to show you. You also have the ability to look at your data um, through different base maps. I use this base map because it's really easy, but I could go to imagery or hybrid or anything on this. So this gives an idea that for me, as I'm allocating funds across the state each year, or I'm passing federal money through, so all of our grants that come from our federal partners, I really quickly can show what's happening where, and I have a core set of data that has um, been verified, it's very confident in that data, that I can then back it up if I'm audited or if I want to show some additional information. So I want to show going from that to another tool that Chuck and his partners uh, were, are able to do also. This is just another GIS component where we take the EdMaps tool, we bring it into something called SIPA, a spatial infestation or um, invasive infestation priority analysis that allows us to take the data from EdMaps and put it into a different structure. The reason we do this in a different structure is because what we want to do is we wanna pull in other elements and then compare those elements to that data set, that core data set. And those elements that we're looking at are like habitat. What is the habitat? in a given area where those points are. Another, let me quickly go down to here. We have the ability to pull in multiple indexes. So if we wanna know like endangered species, where are they located in Utah and what is the priority for them? We pull all of these indexes. We can pull habitat, elk, mule, deer. These are just ones that are important to Utah, water, we can even go into fire and get our fire indexes and put them all into it. And I'll show you what that does. But again, this starts with the core data set from EdMaps as our, as our primary evaluator when a project goes down. When this comes into a SIPA model, um, you can zoom into an area and you have a whole bunch of tools that you can look at where you can see what species, what the percentage of those species. And again, these are all regulated species in Utah, but it allows you to do an analysis on this project using these data points directly from EdMaps. When someone puts a project in, because you have that point data and all of the different indexes, 
it allows it to go and run an analysis and tell you an actual score. And in Utah, we have you know a couple hundred grants that are coming through each year. So if we're going to rank them out and and decide which ones we're going to allocate funds to, we start using these indexes with the EdMaps points to say, okay, what is a high priority area for Utah? And then it actually allows us the system to generate an initial point value for what that project looks like. It also can generate a full map to tell the project manager based on how you answered all the questions in Habitat and what points are there. And it prioritizes them by color, which ones you should do first. And then it generates you know, a lot of other acres reports as to which are federal acres, private acres. But then the really cool thing is, is it shows you all of the point data from EdMaps. So like in this project, there was 3,000, almost 4,000 individual points of garlic mustard. So what is their focus? Where are they putting their energy on it? So that becomes very handy as a tool for us. And again, that's all being driven from the EdMaps data. And then we can take it a step further. So I want to show you, this is a different dashboard that we're running for our projects. So when we get funded, federal or state funding, and we're running through, how do we show the public and show legislators and auditors and push it out to our CWMAs is what's happening in Utah each year. We can run this through a, a dashboard. And again, it starts with those EdMaps points. Let me show you how, if we zoom in on one of these, what you're able to pull out of it. I'll go to 2023. Um, I will pull this one. The project area that was submitted to us to be funded, it pulls in all of the point data from EdMaps where we can see exactly what they've treated in the past, where they're going to treat now, brings in the information for it, tells us how much is federal, private, or state acres. That all comes from the point data, and that evaluation is done. And then once this project is done, if we want to push this front-facing and actually do marketing so we can show you know, legislators and other people how what we're doing with that money, it gives you the ability where we can load up a storyboard. So this is the monitoring that was done on this project where we can quickly push this out to the public through social media so people can see it. The idea is we don't want people to have to ask what's happening in the field. We can actually push it forward and start to generate more money. And I'm going to scroll. I know I hate when people scroll fast, but I, I want to get down to, so there's our data. When Jerry was talking about the pictures on EdMaps Pro, the reason you want to do this is because when you need to do a report or you want to show, regardless if it's at the county or at the federal level, what's happened in the field, it allows you to quickly put a picture and show you know, what's happening in the field. This is a good one right here, in a report. So this is where it started in 2019, and this is how it is in 2021. So are you successful? It's very easy to, to tell the numbers, yeah, we treated this much and we spent this much money, but a picture is worth a thousand words and truly you can show it You know, the easiest through um, being able to do pictures. The nice thing about it too is because you know we started with all of that data, you know, we can track it year after year. If you're doing a multi-year project, when we first started this one, most all of this was red. As you zoom in, you're starting to see, I can look at it more closer to see, okay, the greens are eradicated, they're no longer there, the yellows are being treated last year and actually what the project looks like. And you can capture this and, and be able to show it. The other thing, I'm gonna show you a different one. So this is a, for state money that comes through. The federal, our federal partners, they have a different criteria. They wanna know what the match is. They have a different criteria that is pulling um, from project data. They wanna know how much herbicide monitoring, how much is being protected. 
So you can use that same system and pull the data in. Once you have that core data, um, it, it really is up to you as to what you want to be able to show in your dashboards to be able to tell your story and be able to get it front facing for the public. I think that's one of the things that we have such a hard time as an industry um, in invasive species is we haven't told our story really well. All of us are doing great work, but have we told our story really well? So in this one, it's a completely different sidebar over here. The feds one, wanted to know who our partners were, what that contribution was from partners versus their money. And so you have that flexibility to be able to do it. We're still showing what's being treated and what's positive. And then, you know, the funding on this one. I'm gonna to jump to one more. And this one is a little different. This is our biocontrol dashboard. And the reason I'm showing you this is because the relationship between biocontrol and invasive species is a very close relationship. So we can see where all of our biocontrol is being released, where our monitoring is being done, and where we have all of our insectaries can be put in here. We have the ability where if we want to see how effective that potentially the monitoring is, we can turn on the noxious weeds and overlay the weeds directly from EdMaps to say, okay, that makes sense why we're releasing right here. So many biocontrol releases. And then over time, we can track how effective it is. But it also gives us the ability, if I click on this one on the right, to be able to do the same thing where we can generate a report over here on this side to show what happened with that release. And then the really kind of cool thing is we can create these 30 second social media um, videos that can get pushed out on all the social media channels, or you can download the full report right here. So I'm trying to show you multiple different ways to use that core data set and of what EdMaps, and this doesn't replace what Rebecca showed you with their dashboards is brilliant, and it gives you a lot of information. We've taken some of that and added additional features to it so that we can push it front facing on a continual basis. Um, then the last one is if you want to take it even further, this is the Western Week coordinators. So this is the whole Western United States. Each state who is built and doing their project is funding it up. Right now there's three states that are in it and the idea is to use the EdMaps points, put project information with it and then push it all up so that in Washington DC for a specific funding like the BIL funding, you have all of this information available, the different regional coordinators can come and pull this and show a really good story. I think that's really a, a quick review of how we are using the EdMaps data. And, and I can't stress enough, it is really important that you have a solid data set to work with to make any of these type of GIS programs work um, for you. And then, you know, work directly with Chuck and his partners to be able to build these various different things for you. I think that's it. Thank you so much. I'm going to invite all of our panelists to share their videos and we'll open it up for <laughs> questions for the entire group here. All right. And while we're waiting on some of those to get included here, I was wondering if Chuck, if you have any words you'd like to share with the audience to summarize today's event or if anyone has some big lessons they'd like to share with the audience i guess i'll just thank everybody for coming today we tried to go back to the basics after last year being a more advanced kind of edmap session so hopefully if you were familiar with edmaps then you got something else out of today and if you weren't then you learned about a new tool to help with the fight against um, invasive species. So we will be glad to stick around as long as y'all have questions and, and answer those to the best of our ability. I, I will say, I'm gonna let Aaron tackle the second question, but I will say, 
I'm the programmer of, or past programmer of the people I own right now. And I, and Jonathan, I don't know the answer to whether incorporating the dashboard with Leaflet and ArcGIS online, that is beyond my expertise. So we can look into that or we'll be, we'll be glad to talk to you more about that. But I don't think any of those technologies are currently being used for what you saw today. I will be glad to answer any other questions. Oh, and while we're waiting for some of those, we can go ahead and um, talk about some of the questions we answered in text while the other presentations were going on so that we can make sure that people who didn't have the Q&A up, maybe they have a similar question. Let me, Chuck, if I could, the, the one question I typed it, but that was not good. Let me answer it just straight out. So the question was, is Edmaps the only program we use in Utah? Let me address that. We adopted Edmaps, I think, probably 15 years ago. I don't know how long, Chuck, Chuck it was, but probably 15 years ago for our regulated species. So based on the state statute, we said we need a way of doing this. Edmaps provided a great option for us. And then it's we haven't looked back. I mean, we go full bore with EdMaps. Our data set is very, not secure, but I guess I would say we have a high confidence in our data set. And that doesn't mean that a lot of people in Utah, are, they're using Esri. A lot of data is collected other ways, Esri or through one of the other platforms. What we kind of require, at least for our funding, is that however you collect the data, it has to end up in EdMaps because our tools are using EdMaps to make those evaluations and to promote things forward as part of our marketing campaign and all of that. So for the most part, yes, EdMaps is being used, but others are also. And then we just know that we can get it into EdMaps and, and then we're in good shape. Is that a fair statement, Chuck? Yeah, and some of the data in the dashboards is not that with the story maps and all is stored directly in the Esri system and not in EdMaps, but it's for things like the story maps and those kind of things. But the core treatment data, occurrence data is all in EdMaps, even if it starts somewhere else. And that was a question we had in the chat earlier about, you know, tying EdMaps to a county data collection system. And most of our experience, that is usually some kind of um, Esri art based system. And, you know, going back to my slide with the who, what, when, where, how kind of information, usually you're collecting that kind of information as part of those systems, and it can be exported from that system and put into, um, put into EdMaps fairly easily. Yeah, and uh, one of the things, I, I can't remember if I went over it earlier, but we do have some groups, Colorado specifically coming to mind, that they worked on some training materials on how to export the data from the software some of their counties were using into a format that we could then ingest. So that's on our EdMaps partner resources section of the website where some of those, you know, templates and things like that will exist. And we did get a couple questions about you know, EdMaps is in the US, EdMaps is in Canada, can it be here? And Chuck answered, I believe both of those, but we are always happy to expand out into other areas. What we have found is that we definitely need to have verifiers set up for the data that comes in. Otherwise the data just comes in but doesn't make it make its way onto maps or in data downloads. So we are more than happy to work with different groups on getting that set up in terms of getting verifiers onboarded and any training materials or anything, any help we can provide. It's just that that verifier bottleneck is something that we've run into at times. Yeah. So Jonathan, you put the question, Aaron, can you Talk about how counties might use the EdMaps data for asset management in different departments, public works, parks, recreation. I'm not quite sure on asset management. What I'm thinking you're asking is, you know, for parks, 
cemeteries, all the other different parcels that you have to manage and what's going on with it. I think from a county level or from EdMaps, you should be able to drill down directly to that county level and see what species are there. If you wanted to look at it a little further to see what kind of projects are happening in your county that would incorporate those public area spaces, you know, you would look at it through the projects. You could look at it at the projects da dashboard, but all of that information, anything that you saw that I presented is front facing and you can use it. If a county had uh, a specific index that they would like to use for, you know, private land, public land or something like that, you would just, you know, you, you, we would be able to incorporate it, but we'd just have to look at it across all counties. I don't know if I answered what you were asking. I'm just kind of grabbing out there. <laughs> But feel free to reach out to me. I mean, if there's more you have, reach out and I'll try to explain it better. Yeah, and another question about managing 15,000 acres and, you know, would EdMaps be an appropriate, EdMaps Pro be an appropriate tool to use? And and, and I think absolutely. I, I think that it should work, work pretty well perfectly for your area. And it's just, the, it, again, it's making sure that there's a verifier in place to get that information verified because if not, you'll only be able to see verified data in your data in the in the EdMaps Pro app if you're not yourself a, a verifier. Yeah. Chuck, can I add to that? Sure, go for it. Okay. Yeah. And the importance of that is, you know, it happens to me often where we have over 300 people across the state who are taking data points. And in Utah, we have it set up that the county, someone in a county is the verifier, depending, like if we get close to a grant program and that verifier is on vacation or something, then panic starts. So, you know, make sure that whole system is in place, even with a backup. So that data can be accepted and published in EdMap so that it is available to be able to be seen. The other thing that I would, you know, as you get into this, a lot of people take data different ways. Some people like to take data every two feet. Just realize if you're managing 15,000 acres, if you're going to use EdMaps Pro and you're going to want to do revisits and either change the density, the acres, or even any of the other attributes, you know, if you have one acre a piece, you're going to have 15,000 points that you're going to have to manage each year. And so, be smart about doing it. Maybe you want to make some of those points five acres, 10 acres. Just when you're looking at how do I manage this effectively and be able to go back and revisit the points and be able to tell a story accurately over time. Don't overwhelm yourself, basically is what I'm saying. And, and there's a really interesting, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before, we had back-to-back -back presentations on why you should use points and why you should use polygons. And so if, if you're questioning how you should do it, Utah uses a lot of points, Minnesota uses a lot of polygons, and, and it's, it's one of those real philosophical conversations of neither one's right, neither one's wrong, and, and there's good arguments why you could do it or should do it both ways. So that video is on YouTube, and I would say it'd be worth checking out to find more information about it. Um, um, I just want to say that we do have data contributed by different military bases already in EdMaps. Um, so one thing you can do is if you already have data sets that exist from previous years, you can upload those through the bulk uploader through the, the data upload tool on the tools page. And we can put those past years of data in, and then you can start with 24 or 25, whatever year you want to start using EdMaps or EdMaps Pro. And then you can do revisits to those existing populations rather than starting from scratch and all of that existing data just existing somewhere else. So if there, there are tools in that bulk upload, data upload section for how to 
format data, but you can also always uh, email us with any of those questions. And, and I want to circle back to starting to use EdMaps in an area outside of the U.S. or, or Canada. And, you know, on the website, you can set up your My List of Species, and those come with you to the apps. And so it's all, nothing is geofenced in terms of where you can or cannot use it. So if you're interested in your own Grand Caymans or, or you're, you're somewhere else and you want to use EdMaps, just choose the state as Florida or choose the state as whatever, put the appropriate species on your My Species list, and you can start collecting data. You can try out using the app. And then, you know, make sure it's going to work for you the way you'd want it to work for you. And then we can worry about, you know, getting the verifiers in place and how that data would be displayed if it's outside. So, you know, there's no, the limitation comes in on how things are mapped and how things are verified currently, but it doesn't mean you can't try the apps out, even if you're outside of the U.S. or Canada. Um, and. There's a question about verifier training. We, we do have a verifier training information available. I, I wouldn't say that we necessarily have badges or, or um, micro-credential type things um, for everything that we need in place yet or, or that specific for some of the verifiers. But, you know, if there's a need there to help you with, you know, in your position to do continuing ed the way you need to do it, to check boxes for somebody, then, you know, I, I think that's something, you know, that's what we do. We're UGA, we're educate, you know, our group is extension outreach. And so the education part of this is a big piece and, and very important to the whole process. Whether it's educating verifiers or educating users of the system um, or working with those partners. And, one of the comments in the chat about, you know, linking data versus bulk exports and bulk imports. We're going to be doing some of that in the next year with the USGS Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database. That data is going to be overlaid on the EdMaps for the species that we both track. And so that data won't be pulled into EdMaps. The biggest negative of that right now is it makes it where you cannot do revisits on the data you're overlaying. And so, you know, that's the one concern we have in terms of some of those features. But in terms of getting the data out, that's why we're publishing the data to ArcGIS online. And so if you have that capability in your system, then that's published near real time or nightly. And so you can always pull from that resource and get to the public data set that way to integrate it into whatever application you have on your end. I do think uh, someone asked earlier about if they report to iNaturalist, does it make its way into EdMaps? And we showed earlier about how, you know, there are checks in place for getting iNaturalist data into EdMaps. So we do pull the research grade data in and the verifiers help to pull in the records fully to, you know, based on what they want to do with those particular records. And as Chuck, I think, mentioned to the person asking the question that currently we don't have a link between, you know, the person's iNaturalist account to that data, all the data is going in under an iNaturalist reporter account. But there may be a way to show on like a profile if a person has an iNaturalist account. Someone asked, is office hours being held in April? Yes, I think that was on the rotating PowerPoint during the breaks that the next Bugwood office hours is... The 12th, I think. I think it's like 12th. Yeah. So, and yeah, and these are not monthly. These are every other week currently. We might play around with how often we have those. And it is to allow anybody to drop in, ask questions, anything that comes up. 
So that way it's more interactive than the previous EdMaps office hours. People can actually speak, <laughs> speak to us and, and ask questions. And we've had a couple really good um, sessions where people just ask any question about reporting or using any of the resources. Hey, Chuck, can I, <clears throat> while we're waiting for another question, can I make another point on verifiers? So one thing that I don't know, I mean, it was hit by multiple people, but I think it's a, a huge importance. When you go through the verifier training and you become a verifier, the one thing that becomes super important to you as a verifier is that they take a picture. Eventually, and Kevin and Jerry can chime in on this also, eventually whoever the verifier is becomes very familiar with who is putting the point data in their area um, where to the point where they're like, okay, I, I'm very confident with the skill level of this person, but even then you still want a picture or you got to drive all the way out and do a verification in the field. Having a picture is just brilliant. So if when you do that training, if you don't have this set up, the, for the verifier and that verifier goes and starts to do the verification, reach out to the people. There is an email there. If you get a bunch of point data coming in and there's no pictures attached and you don't know who it is, reach out to them, make that contact, you know, try to find out who they are and what are they capable of doing a specific identification in the field on something. But yeah, the pictures are brilliant. So push, push, push to have pictures taken with that, you know, your data points or your polygons or whatever, because it really speeds up that verification process like tremendously. Yeah, and, and like Aaron was saying, in the record review process, there are a number of automated buttons that the verifiers have they can press a button and request images to go with the record. They can press a button and send a message, uh, an email to the reporter asking for more information. What they can also do is if they're looking at a record and you know, Aaron's look, looking at a record, he's like, okay, they reported this as spotted napweed, but this is obviously squaro napweed. I don't know what they were thinking. Aaron, Jerry, whoever can edit that subject, update that subject to the proper subject. So it shows up on the right maps and that record isn't lost just because it was, it was incorrect. So there, the verifiers have several things they can do to help make those records better. In addition to reviewing the record as it came in. Yeah. It looks like we're getting a couple more questions in. I don't understand that if you get information from not only iNaturalists, is that shown in Ed maps? I'm, I'm not sure what that question is about. Yeah, there is data from iNaturalist that gets pulled into EdMaps and then obviously, you know, data from other places. I think the only data in EdMaps that the next question is about observation date that does not have observation dates associated with it is the data that came from the USDA plants database and the data that came from the Violet of North America project. Those are the largest two data sets. It's about 600,000 of the 8 million records that does, that, you know, those are two big sets that do not have observation dates. And that's because in a lot of cases that's tied back to literature or herbarium specimens. And it, there was not, a, sometimes there's a year in the reference if you look at the data, but in a lot of cases, there's not a direct observation date. And if, you're getting a bunch of nulls on data that is not that, then reach out to us and let us know because that may be something with the download that's, that's throwing nulls in there instead of the actual dates. Question about guidelines for taking photos. Yeah, we put together and it's still available on the EdMaps um, website under the training materials, a kind of an EdMaps handbook. And there is a section in there about taking pictures. Usually what you know, if we're training somebody on how to use this, it's usually trying to get a close-up picture that has identifying characteristics of the plant, if we're talking about a plant. Obviously, for 
insects and animals, it becomes more difficult to just take a picture of the organism. But uh, with insects or even with animals, sometimes you could take pictures of the damage they caused if you can't actually get the actual um, organism. But for plants, it's, it's usually try to take those pictures that would be useful to help identify the species and then step back, zoom out and get the larger area. So you get a better view of the context of where that plant was. And so those two things are, are you know, are really, if, if I was going to give a, sh a short tutorial, um, those are really the two things. Take a, take a couple of close-up pictures and then a couple of zoomed out pictures where you can really get a, a feel for not only ways to identify the plant, but also the habitat and the area that the plant was found in. Yeah, Chuck, and, and I, I will add a little bit more, Paula. I mean, that was one of the reasons uh, for the development of the photo in the pro version was where you can ghost an image and line yourself back up. When you're dealing with comparison pictures where you want to say, okay, two years later, what does this look like? I mean, we, I've seen it for years and years where I'm like, these are great pictures, but there's no common feature in the background to say they're at the same place. So having dealt with that, that was a lot of development to get that built into the EdMaps Pro specifically to be able to capture, you know, that comparison from one point in time to another point in time, and you're in the exact same spot. Um, in Utah, we do training almost twice a year with invite people to come to say, here's how you document a project. Here's how you document a project because it's so important to be able to do that. And I'm hoping with this new feature that Chuck has integrated into the pro version that, I mean, that is gonna become very nice and I'm starting to see those comparison photos in their final reports year after year. Yeah, and, and I mean, what what is great is every year, every generation of phones, the cameras keep getting better and better. And so, you know, that we're seeing that across the board in terms of just the hardware that's included in our phones now, you know, when we get new ones that you can really start seeing, you know, a difference in the quality. And then that even becomes more useful with the before and after pictures. I will say on the iPhone, I know we're limited to portrait pictures for those before and after um, picture. So just something to think about that interface is set up only portrait because of a uh, limitation within the um, camera module on the iPhones. Well, I love the question about uh, deep fake generated species. You know, we get them the, we get them the opposite way. People go to our website and grab a picture of Japanese honeysuckle and then submit it along with their report. So they don't, and usually they don't even crop the UGA ID, the black ID on the bottom corner off of it. So it makes it very easy to know that it didn't come from, the, that it wasn't part of the picture. One thing we found is by requiring you to have an account and log in, then we don't get a bunch of random junk that I think we would get if you could, if it was very easy to just submit data anonymously. And so I think that limits it a little bit. We, we see them occasionally, but we get more probably test reports where people are testing something and send something in than we get where somebody's trying to be maliciously bad to report things. But those AI generators are getting better and better. I was playing around with one um, for this presentation and that, you know, bad data in, bad data out graphic was created using one of those AI image generators. So I, I think we're going to see more and more of that. And that's where what Aaron was saying that knowing the person, you get used to what the person submitting as the verifier. And when you see somebody you don't recognize, that's when you would jump in and, and question it more than if it was somebody that you were used to verify. Yeah. Well, and one other thing, Chuck, I'll add to that. And I don't know if this is how it is across. I know how it is for Utah. The verifiers that we've chosen in Utah are responsible. They're land managers for a given area. 
they are fairly uh, apt at what is in their county or what is in their given area. And so if something was AI generated and put in and it's brand new and they're like, okay, I've been out there within the year, I've kind of been in this area that doesn't seem right. Even if it's a great picture, if it's something new, they're going to go and do the ground truthing on it and say, because it's unique. If it's totally out of line, it is going to be a huge red flag for them. But let's say that it's something that they know is in the area and they go ahead and accept it. Most likely someone is going to be in that area, you know, within six months or within that field season where they can follow up on it. So there's a potential, but I don't think it would stay very long before that would get updated as, nah, this isn't it. So as long as you have those protocols in place, then I think you're covered. And I will say, I, I do spend some time on iNaturalist just to see what they're doing as well as I, I do contribute non-invasive reports there as well. And I and other people have, on there have come across in identifying some of their records that are submitted that people do sometimes just take photos from the internet and upload them either because, and again, seeing this in both places, I saw something, it looked like this. So it's not their own photo, but they're picking something that is the closest thing to what they found, or they just upload a photo for some reason uh, that nobody can really figure out why. So it's going to happen here and there, but because of the checks and ad maps and also the, you know, people seeing things in iNaturalist and there being a lot of local people there as well, those things get found out pretty quickly. And especially if it's something really high profile, like a emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle, giant hogweed, something like that, it's going to be discovered even quicker because of the amount of response something like those species will have. Yeah. So it's it's really that's where this whole community comes into play is everybody's checking each other's work and somewhere along the way, someone's going to figure out if something's a little off. Yeah. And there's a lot of, when you talk about the community, it's like if, if something shows up in Twila County and Hunter, Jerry is questioning it and he hasn't been up there, he knows who to call in the forest service and say, Hey, have you been up there? Is that really up there? So there's a lot of, additional outside of the system verification going on. And that's the point of who you pick as verifiers. I think the more funny ones are actually when a picture comes in and it's not it, but you look right above what they think that they're putting in and there's another species there and you're like, well, well, that's there, but this isn't it. Yeah, y'all found garlic mustard or something. Yeah. Man, a photo of did. something else. That, yeah. I'm like, well, well, look at that. And we've had some cool situations where people have taken pictures off the internet. They did modify them and then uploaded it as a report. And so, and there was a response to it and it ended up being a, a false report. So yeah, we've, we've had some conversations about putting, about putting, you know, statements that, Hey, if you fraudulently do this, there could be legal ramifications from the, from the state on that. But but we are we're right up at uh, at three o'clock and thank y'all all for sticking around four hours is a long time and we really appreciate it and feel free to reach out with other questions and suggestions and comments etc <laughs> and thanks to Nazma for hosting us again thank you to all of our speakers that was really fabulous and we've had some fantastic comments. Hopefully you've been able to see those in the chat and the Q&A as well. I think today was really valuable to both beginners and, and experts. We really covered everything today. So thank you everybody. We did get another comment about the recording. So I will be processing this recording after the event and we'll get it posted to Naisma's uh, YouTube channel. And also we'll send it to the folks at Bugwood, and I believe you're going to post it on your um, channel as well. So um, there'll be plenty of access if you missed anything today. But thanks everyone for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>